Friends and comrades, welcome to the second annual Progressive International Summit. The summit this year is called the Summit at the End of the World. This might seem like an exaggeration, but the truth is that the end of the world is here. It's not the future, but the present for many people across the world who are facing heat waves, food shortages, famines, and disease and contagion. So we want to build a new one to replace this dying world with life, love, and popular sovereignty. This month is also a special month for us here at the Progressive International because it's our second anniversary. Over the last two years, we've built a powerful network of labor unions, political parties, left-wing social forces and movements from across the world, only with your support. We led the Make Amazon Pay campaign, which led a historical strike against Amazon in over 20 countries. We launched the observatory that defended and protected democratic forces from Colombia to Ecuador to Peru to Bolivia. And we also had the fight against the International Monetary Fund and big pharmaceutical companies that are standing in the way of vaccinating the world against COVID-19. Remember that all of this is possible exclusively by support from people like you. So if you can consider becoming a donor, please do so. It powers our spirits and keeps the PI alive. So with that, we have a terrific lineup for you here today and tomorrow with speakers who are engaged in key battles for food, land, hunger, democracy and peace from across the world. I hope that we can all experience what the late David Graeber called political pressure or the joy that I would argue is inherent to making solidarity more than a slogan that's undeniably bound up in being bound up in a collective project together. With that, I'm honoured and delighted to welcome Jeremy Corbyn, a council member and a member of the UK Parliament, and Gustavo Merela, the governor of Tierra del Fuego in Argentina, to open today's summit. Hello, friends. I'm delighted to address you today at the Progressive International's second summit. These talks often begin with the speaker stressing that we meet at an urgent moment, but today, when you look around you, you can't help but see it's true. So much is happening in the world, and so quickly, that sometimes it's dizzying and hard to keep up. The Progressive International is a young project, but it has already done so much to bring us together, to act for radical change, and to make our fast-moving world comprehensible. I'm proud that the Peace and Justice Project is a member, and I'm honored to sit on the council with so many inspiring leaders and activists. The PI's first summit held in September 2020 took place under the title of Extinction or Internationalism. A year and a half on, we have to be realistic. The dial has edged closer to extinction. Last month, the UN's climate scientists warned it's now or never to limit global warming. You can almost hear them screaming at their keyboards, desperate for governments to actually do something. When they outline the need for rapid, deep and immediate cuts in carbon dioxide emissions, the red alert comes after the failure of COP26 in Glasgow, where we had to rely on alternative voices at the margins of the event to tell us the truth and plan a better future. But their words and those of the scientists are not just a warning about the future. They describe the present reality for billions of people. South Asia is now in the third month of extreme heat with temperatures soaring above 40 degrees centigrade day after day. Imagine that, no respite, no relief, working in that heat. We humans are incredibly adaptable. But death comes sooner when it is so hot. Scientists have found that even relatively small increases in average temperature hugely increase the risk of mass heat-related deaths. We've seen how extreme heat causes forest fires, destroying habitats and killing animals and people. 30 million people were displaced by climate shocks in 2020 and those shocks store up more strife to come by wrecking harvests. Punjab, India's breadbasket, has already seen a worrying drop in wheat yield this year due to the heat. And it's not just South Asia that is sweltering in March. Both the Arctic and the Antarctic were 30 degrees Celsius above their usual average temperature. At the same time, let me say it again, 
the North Pole and the South Pole were both 30 degrees Celsius warmer than usual in March. Ice is melting and sea levels are rising. Small island nations are at risk, as are the many billions of people who live on a coast or rely on supply chains that need coastal infrastructure. We know that the ruling economic model, with the pollution, extraction and built-in obsolescence, has little regard for our environment. But it's arteries, the global supply chains that connect the world's mines, factories, shipping lanes, ports, warehouses, delivery networks and consumers are already massively disrupted, even before the full effects of climate breakdown are felt. In the heavily integrated global capitalist economy, especially after decades of the International Monetary Fund forcing countries to abandon production for their domestic market, disruption spells disaster. Already over 800 million people, one in 10 of the entire world's population, go to bed hungry. The price of wheat has doubled already this year and it could rise further as the effects of Russia's criminal invasion of Ukraine and Russia's resulting partial economic isolation is felt. The two countries were in the top five wheat exporters in the world before the war. Many countries in the global south rely on them for their food supplies. Russia's war on Ukraine must be condemned. And it should focus our attention on all the other victims of war in belligerent countries and all around the world. Of course, we stand with the people of Ukraine as we stand with every people suffering invasion, displacement and occupation. And we must remain utterly steadfast as progressive movements around the world in our support for refugees whose rights and lives must be protected. Those fleeing the violence and the hunger in Afghanistan and Yemen, now the world's poorest places after their destruction by war, must be met with humanity and hospitality, not racism and resentment. Wars lead to hunger, mental distress, misery and death for years after the fighting has stopped. We have no time to waste. There must be an immediate ceasefire, the withdrawal of Russian forces and a negotiated settlement. If there isn't, not only will the Ukrainian people continue to face the horror of shells, tanks and air raid sirens, not only will Ukrainian refugees suffer uncertain futures and dislocation from their families and communities, not only will young Russian conscripts be sent off to be brutalized in the army and die in a foreign land for a war they don't understand. Not only will Russian people suffer under sanctions, not only will the people of Egypt, Somalia, Laos, Sudan and many others that rely on wheat from the belligerent nations face rising hunger. Not only will prices for consumers all over the world rise, intensifying the struggle just to get by. But everyone on Earth faces the threat of nuclear Armageddon, the threat of direct confrontation between Russia and NATO forces is a clear and present danger to all of us. Both sides are being egged on by wild and dangerous forces in their respective media. These actions are extremely dangerous. They build an atmosphere of maximum threat and fear that makes the end of life as we know it much more likely. We've been here before. Most people don't know how close we came to nuclear war. In 1983, the Soviet leadership was convinced that the West was going to launch a nuclear attack. On the 26th of September, the Soviet nuclear early warning system went off, suggesting the US had begun one. Protocol held that the USSR would launch an immediate retaliatory nuclear strike. The duty officer, Stanislav Petrov, overrode that protocol, preventing 
a retaliatory strike, believing or maybe hoping that it was a false alarm. He waited in those very nervous minutes to see if the bombs would land. He was right and he had saved humanity. That's how close we came to annihilation. One man countermanding the established military protocols and trusting his own instincts over the technology. That's why it's so important that we support the nuclear weapons ban, the global ban treaty, which is now part of international law, thanks to inspiring campaigning by countries in the global south. And we must now come together to build a global peace movement. As the Progressive International's political declaration states, dismantle the war machine and build diplomacy of peoples. It will not be easy. Weapons companies do extremely well out of war. They fund politicians and think tanks. They have their many media mouthpieces. Those that strive for real peace are vilified because behind conflict stands the interests of the war machine. It's why campaigners for justice are so relentlessly attacked too. They threaten the ill-gotten wealth and power of the few. We see it time and time again. Their interests are not the general interests. They're not your interests. We see it with painful clarity in the pandemic as Big Pharma refuses to share vaccine technology that was mainly developed with public funds. Who benefits? The pharma executives and shareholders? Who loses? Everyone else. More mothers and fathers die, more livelihoods are wrecked, and the threat of viral mutation hangs over everyone, vaccinated and unvaccinated alike. How do they get away with it? They've convinced governments of some of the richest and most powerful countries that corporate interests, that their interests, it's no conspiracy, just look at the facts. The state is used to prop up the wealth of the richest central banks, pumped in nine trillion in 2020 in response to the pandemic. The result, billionaire wealth went up by 50% in one year, when at the same time the world economy shrank, it got smaller. The billionaires and corporations claim to hate government action. In reality, they love it. The only thing they hate is governments acting in your interests. And so they fight to keep governments in their pocket and try to overthrow those that aren't. They need the state to prop them up with economic growth likely to be low in the coming decades as the elite avoids and mismanages the energy transition. The wealth and the debts of the powerful will need constant buttressing by central banks and government policy. So when we step back and survey all of those dangers and dynamics that go with them, a truth dawns on us. We used to think that there were a series of distinct crises, the climate, the refugees, the housing, the debt, the inequality, the crisis with the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. We tried to isolate each one and solve it. Then we began to realize that the major crises of capital, climate and empire were interlocking. So we had to engage with all of them at the same time, but in different ways. Now we can see that we don't face multiple separate crises the system itself is the crisis. The global system is not in a crisis <clears throat> that can be resolved. The system is crisis and must be overcome and replaced, transformed, as the slogan goes. We need system change, not climate change. <clears throat> That's why this week, the Progressive International meets under the not so cheery title of Summit at the End of the world. Because the end of the world is already here. It is just unevenly distributed. The image of apocalypse, bombs and raids, oil spills and wildfires, 
disease and contagion is reality for people across the planet. The periphery is the future, not the past. We were told that developed countries give the developing an image of their future. But the periphery sits at the vanguard of history, where the crisis of capital hit hardest. The consequences of climate collapse arrive the quickest, and the call to resist them rings the loudest. And that resistance <clears throat> is powerful and inspiring. There is plenty, however, plenty to give us hope. Since the last Progressive International Summit, the world witnessed the largest strike in history. Indian farmers and their worker allies resisted two neoliberal bills that the Modi government wanted to force through their parliament. The farmers stood up for themselves, their livelihoods and the needs of the poor. And they won. Or take Amazon, the world's fifth largest company that made record profits in the pandemic. Its greed and exploitation is being fiercely resisted by workers, communities and activists on every continent in the world. They've come together to make Amazon pay. In Latin America, <clears throat> in country after country, the people are rallying to support progressive political leaders to say no more the domination by capital, the destruction of their communities and the abuse of their environments. But it's not enough just to resist. We have to build too. And that's why I see in communities all over the world, people coming together in the face of adversity and realizing that if they work together, they achieve more. Socialism is already in our communities. It's our job, our cause to nurture it into a powerful alternative. And that is what we're doing here this week. This summit is a site of construction. Why are we taking stock of this dying world? It is to build the new one that will replace it, brimming with life, bound by love, powered by popular sovereignty. How do we do that? It's so urgent. There really is no more time to waste. First, we unite progressive forces on the need to come together across borders and across issues to mobilize and organize to confront the crisis of capital, climate and empire. That means the task facing each and every one of us is twofold. We strengthen workers and rural workers in their struggle against exploitation people and communities in their fight for dignity, and progressive forces to mobilize state power. And we bring them all together into powerful people's alliances with the capacity to remake the world. As the system breaks down, we will face the champions of reaction as well as the elite that wants to keep things as they are. We've already had a taste of their poison with Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi, Erdogan, Putin, and Duterte. To defeat these monsters of our time and new ones to come, we build popular power to unite the struggle against the end of the world. With the struggle at the end of the month, our movements must make life better for most people with secure livelihoods. Housing, healthcare, more time to spend with friends and loved ones, power over their own lives and a clean and safe and sustainable environment. If we do that, we will breed hope over despair and we will give life to a new world out of the ashes of this one. So I want you today to commit. Double your efforts in the struggle you're involved in. Join that campaign you've been thinking about joining. Show that real solidarity. Stand up to bullies build trade unions, be part of movements, and help bring them together, as we're doing today at the Progressive International. A new world is ours to build. Do it for yourself, do it for your family, do it for your community, 
do it for humanity. There's no one coming to save us, just ourselves. If we don't, life will be much worse for most people in a generation's time. But if we do, life will be much better. I want you to be able to look back in a generation's time and say, yes, I built the trade unions, the community organisations, the social movements, the campaigns, the parties, the international that turned the tide. I want you to be able to say, yes, we are the greatest generation that together produced and distributed the food, homes and healthcare. So no one endures poverty, preserved and shared the wisdom of the people of this planet, spread love between people and communities, built the energy system to decarbonize our planet, dismantled the war machine and supported refugees, reined in the power of the billionaires and secured a new international economic order. Will it be easy? Of course not. We will face enormous resistance. Of course we will. There will be ups and there will be downs, but every day we can wake up and know that we will do our small bit. That's all we can do day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, building our campaigns, building our movements, building our power and taking the future into our own hands. That's how great victories were won in the past. All the struggles that came together for the vote, for independence, for civil rights, for land, for health, for jobs, that made our world more civilized. We can take great strength and pride from this history. And we can, and we will, stand on the shoulders of the world's young and claim their future and opportunities. Even in the face of enormous resistance and oppression and a system falling apart, we will build a world fit for the next generation. As the great and wonderful Chilean poet Pablo Neruda once wrote, you can cut all the flowers, but you cannot stop spring from coming. And spring, my friends, is coming. Desde la provincia de Tierra del Fuego, Antártida e Islas del Atlántico Sur de la ciudad de Ushuaia, quiero darles la bienvenida a esta gran cumbre que se iba a realizar en nuestra ciudad, pero por cuestiones de la pandemia no se puede realizar. Pero desde acá, desde el fin del mundo, desde la puerta de ingreso a la Antártida, de esta zona de paz y cooperación del Atlántico Sur, queremos a todos desearles lo mejor y mantener viva esa esperanza y esa llama y ese faro que teníamos en nuestra presentación en este encuentro de la Internacional Progresista. Para nosotros es muy importante, desde este lugar, tan mirado por todo el mundo, tan deseado, tan querido, donde los recursos naturales se cuidan, donde vivimos fuertemente la humanidad, donde queremos otra nueva historia, queremos otro planeta, un planeta más justo, inclusivo, igualitario en serio, donde desde acá reclamamos para que se termine el colonialismo en el mundo, como lo sufrimos nosotros en nuestras queridas Islas Malvinas. Desde acá nosotros también reclamamos contra este capitalismo salvaje, donde la persona, la humanidad, queda totalmente de lado. Así que creo que es eh, no solo mi deseo, el deseo de todos, eh, y el gran desafío, y por sobre todas las cosas, es nuestro compromiso de seguir trabajando por un mundo distinto, por un mundo más justo, un mundo igualitario, donde todas las personas, seamos con quienes seamos, tengamos las mismas oportunidades, los mismos derechos. Lo mejor para esta cumbre, y cuando se pueda, los esperamos en nuestra querida provincia, de Tierra del Fuego, Antártida e Islas del Atlántico Sur. La humanidad se encuentra en un momento crucial. No solamente la guerra y el cambio climático amenazan la vida en nuestro planeta. Las ideologías y algunas personas también. Sabemos que el dinero y la producción de riqueza y de bienestar han creado una brecha cada vez más grande y profunda entre personas, barrios, ciudades, y países que se han exacerbado tras la pandemia. Entonces, quisiera dejar de pensarnos como la periferia pobre de una globalización desigual, colonial y racista. En Bolivia, desde el inicio de este siglo, batallamos con algunas de las cuestiones más importantes y decisivas para el futuro de la especie humana. El agua, 
nuestra sagrada hoja de coca, los bienes que podemos repartir gracias a la generosidad de la Pachamama y, por supuesto, el derecho a decidir colectivamente sobre nuestras vidas. Cada lucha, cada esfuerzo realizado desde lugares como el Alto Cochabamba nos enfrentaron y enfrentan no solo con los dueños del poder y del dinero. En el fondo de cada una de nuestras luchas está la imperiosa necesidad que tenemos de seguir vivos, de construir por fin un mundo a la medida de todos para vivir con dignidad, no mañana, hoy. Bolivia es el centro del mundo, como lo es Dakota del Norte o Chiapas o los barrios pobres de Caracas. Sí, somos pobres y estamos alejados de los omnipotentes centros de decisión política y económica, pero al mismo tiempo vivimos en el centro de las más importantes batallas. Batallas que se libran desde nuestras pequeñas trincheras, comunidades, barrios, ciudades, selvas y bosques. Lo que les digo no es para nosotros un simple cambio de discurso. Queremos pensarnos de manera diferente, porque así, en el centro de la verdadera lucha por la vida, podemos mirar al mundo y a nuestras hermanas y hermanos con ojos nuevos. Condenados a la marginalidad, no vamos a llegar muy lejos. Es así que construyendo desde los cientos y miles de centros en los que se define la vida, se pelea por lo más elemental, agua, comida, techo, educación, dignidad, quizá podamos construir un horizonte nuevo. Tejiendo nuestras necesidades, nuestros logros y hasta nuestros errores, es posible ir desmantelando siglos de colonialismo, de brutal expolio de los territorios, y de sometimiento forzado de la gente. En Bolivia hemos tenido que echar mano de nuestras tradiciones y conocimientos milenarios. Aymaras y quechuas, por ejemplo, pueblos que definen mucho de lo que este país es. Pero no es solamente con lo indígena originario que hemos luchado contra el capital, ni es tampoco obligación de ningún pueblo ser la vanguardia o la reserva moral para la especie humana. Somos lo que hay. Sabemos entre nosotros lo que nos legaron nuestros abuelos. Por eso, desde nuestra experiencia vivida, les invito a iniciar este camino, primero resignificando lo que importa, para luego mirarnos así, como se miraba la gente en las calles de Cochabamba luego de la Guerra del Agua, sabiendo que se puede, que hay otra vida esperando detrás de las barricadas, de las huelgas y de los bloqueos de caminos, y que es nuestro patrimonio común. También nos ocurrió en octubre de 2003, cuando el alto se convirtió por unos instantes en el centro del mundo. Con palos y con piedras, con voluntad, los aymaras rechazaron la venta de nuestra riqueza, la muerte recetada por un presidente corrupto e insensato. Ahí, en ese epicentro ardiendo, todo lo que es vital estaba en fuego. Los centros de poder y de decisión mundial eran nuestra periferia. Definitivamente, no pienso que seamos la periferia. Este mi disenso no pretende ser paralizador. Todo lo contrario. Como boliviano, como aymara, como alguien que ha vivido dentro de las más decisivas batallas para cambiarlo todo, sé que no podemos ignorar la catástrofe cotidiana que vivimos en Sri Lanka, en los botes llenos de refugiados en el Mediterráneo, en ese muro que separa a Norteamérica de toda América, en los territorios aborígenes de Australia o en la hambruna de niñas y niños en la Guajira colombiana. Para mirar la inmensidad de nuestro horizonte, para soñar despiertos como miramos el altiplano andino y sus cumbres, quizá debiéramos darnos una perspectiva distinta, una centralidad nueva. En Bolivia, como en tantos otros lugares, lo que ha estado en juego no es un conjunto de bienes o un pedazo de tierra ni un gobierno. Hemos peleado para defender la vida, para alimentarla y verla crecer con dignidad. No conocemos nada más importante que hacer en estos tiempos difíciles. Somos el centro del mundo.
Welcome to the summit at the end of the world. As we are celebrating the anniversary of the Progressive International, uh, we are gathering here not only to share the experiences of our struggles to reflect on the condition of the world today, which, as we know, is not really in the bad, uh, in a good condition. Uh, we are also gathering in order to reflect on the day after tomorrow, uh, namely to imagine how the world could look like after the end of the world. Uh, the motto of uh, this year's Progressive International Summit is that the end of the world is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, and we can see it, unfortunately, with our eyes. Uh, today, uh, I'm joined by uh, Eje Temelkuran, a writer, journalist, council member of the Progressive International and a dear friend uh, who is joining us uh, from Hamburg. Uh, hi, Eje. Hi, hi, Srećko. And uh, we're also joined by Franco Berardi Bifo, uh, one of my dearest contemporary philosophers uh, who has written uh, uh, many texts recently on the contemporary world crisis, uh, who is joining us, I guess, from Italy, right, Franco? Yes, I am in Italy. <laughs> in... So and I'm say... happy to be with you this morning. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also happy. So before uh, before we start, uh, uh, we will we will we'll have short presentations by by each of us, uh, and uh, we'll have a joint uh, discussion. Uh, and before we start, I would just love to kind of uh, paint uh, the settle the ground to put it like that and paint a picture of uh, the kind of points we could discuss today, uh, because I think what is needed uh, besides you know, being paralyzed by the contemporary constant bad news and catastrophic images. And, uh, you know, many people feel it on their skins as well. We feel it as well. Luckily, we are privileged to, to, to speak here about these kind of topics. Uh, but I would love us to, to, to go into a more broader context uh, and also to allow us, allow ourselves a kind of temporal shift, you know, uh, to speak about resistance beyond the apocalypse. What does it mean? You know, what does it mean to, uh, to organize today, to mobilize today, uh, to resist uh, uh, if we know that the end of the world already happened? Uh, and uh, I'm not just speaking about the different possible ends of the world, which might happen, but the ends of the world, which already happened, I mean, from... Uh, uh, you know, the, from slavery to the genocide uh, in the Americas uh, to, to, to many different catastrophes of the 20th century, but also those to come. Uh, so I would love to start with, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, anecdote, uh, which is not just an anecdote, uh, which actually really happened, but it sounds like an anecdote. You know, you probably remember that interview which Adorno gave uh, for Der Spiegel, you know, the, the leading German newspaper when in 1969 uh, they asked him, uh, Herr Professor, uh, uh, you know, uh, two weeks ago the world still seemed to be okay. And then Adorno famously answered, not to me. Uh, and I think uh, the three of us can share this. Uh, of course, that uh, we, two weeks ago, two months ago, we didn't believe that the world uh, is in a good shape. But of course, today I think we would share that it's in a, even worse shape and that it might be even worse. Uh, so what I prepared here uh, for, for the start is uh, a short reflection on Günther Anders, uh, a philosopher which uh, is here to us and uh, who is becoming more and more important uh, in the 21st century, uh, who in 1963, so that's only six years before Adorno said that, you know, for him, not everything was okay. Uh, and he wasn't surprised. In 1963, Günther Anders gives a speech in Germany at the peace protest. You know, that was the age of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the world was on the brink of a nuclear war, similarly to today. Uh, and uh, Günther Anders held a speech about the three world, world wars. You know, already in 1963, he's speaking about the three world wars as if the third world war already happened. And he said, what we have to do in order to actually prevent the third world war uh, is to have a kind of temporal shift uh, uh, and a sort of mourning in advance for, 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 for those who will die tomorrow. And he starts this speech, so this is 1963, with, with the following words. 
uh, dear comrades living in the end of time, we have come together to commemor commemorate the death of the three world wars. Everyone should try to remember one death, uh, one past and one future death. Uh, one, one person should remember an ir irradiated child in Hiroshima. Another should remember a burnt woman in Dresden. A third should remember a killed Jew of Auschwitz. And then Anders goes on, you know, the fourth, the sixth, the seventh. And he says, an eighth person should remember a child who will be irradiated tomorrow. A nine should remember a sailor who will drown tomorrow. A tenth should remember a child who will not be born tomorrow. And I want to start by this because it kind of gives us a temporal shift, you know, that besides just reflecting on the catastrophes of the past or the catastrophes which are happening today as we speak, uh, the total climate collapse, the never ending war and wars are across the world, uh, but also the nuclear catastrophe, which might either be a nuclear war or it might be a new Chernobyl or actually in Chernobyl again, uh, I think we have to remember the death of the future itself. And if you are speaking about the death of the future, uh, you know, which is uh, uh, a concept Franco Berardi Bifo was dealing with, uh, then we also have to come to the question with which you, Edge, were dealing with, which is, you know, how to come together in this kind of apocalyptic circumstances and conditions uh, and uh, what to do with hope. Is there hope? Can hope be constructed? How can we go beyond the contemporary paralysis? Uh, or what people would call impotence, uh, or what I would call melancholy, you know, influenced by Walter Benjamin uh, and his texts on melancholy. You know, how can we go beyond it if we know that the world uh, is ending and that it ends every day as we speak in many parts of the world? Uh, how can we actually, you know, construct something which would go beyond, but not in the sense of constructing some utopia which would come the day after, but how can we do it actually now? Uh, so I would start with these kind of questions uh, and leave the floor to first to Franco and then to Egypt, and then uh, we, we, we have a discussion together. So Franco, please. Uh, ciao. <clears throat> In the year 1918, at the end of the First World War, a psychoanalyst who an Hungarian psychoanalyst whose name is Sandor Ferenczi, one of the colleagues of Sigmund Freud, the first generation of psychoanalysts, um, asked the question, is it possible to heal, to... to to act therapeutically uh, in a condition of uh, mass psychosis, when the condition that uh, uh, we call psychosis uh, becomes uh, <coughs> a, a, a social, a collective condition, when the the effects of uh, depression and uh, of uh, mania are, uh, have, have uh, gone beyond the limits uh, of uh, individual suffering. In such a situation, is it possible to heal the malady? The answer of Sandor Ferenczi is no. Psychosis can be healed at the individual level. It cannot be healed when it becomes a process of massive, uh, of massive uh, uh, psychosis. So we know what happened uh, later. The 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 Ferenczi consideration dates 1918, immediately after we have in Italy the victory of the fascist party, in Russia we have the, the, the spread of uh, Stalinism, in, in Germany we have at the end 
the victory of Adolf Hitler and the following uh, events that we know very well. If Ferenc was right, no way we are entering a long lasting age of uh, mass psychosis, but uh, the, the context is different from 100 years ago because we have tools for the final destruction of the planet. Uh, so our intellectual effort, our uh, intention must be invested in the direction of uh, negating the assertion of Sandor Ferenczi. We must reverse the idea that mass psychosis is untreatable. That is our only, I don't say hope because I hope nothing. This is our only intellectual uh, possibility. So I look at the present, I try to listen to the voices of people that I know, particularly young people. And I, I try to understand what is happening, what has happened yesterday. And I say, during the two years of the pandemics, I have been, I have been trying to imagine what is the, the, the landscape beyond this threshold, the, 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 the landscape may be marked by depression and we are clearly in a, in a time of massive, of epidemic depression. But depression is not a stable condition. It may be a, a evoluting condition. So what is the evolution? of depression, the evolution of depression can be the same that we have experienced 100 years ago. Depression may evolve into, into aggressiveness. Aggressiveness, violence, murder are tools for coming out of a depression huh? and preparing uh, the final catastrophe. But this is not the only one exit from the depression. There is another possibility. The other possibility I call resignation. The other possibility I call accepting the fact that the human history has exploded and we can no more live inside the dominant uh, space of human history. We have to come out from that. We have to accept the idea that only seceding communities, only communities that go away from the historical time can survive. That is the very simple point today. Only accepting reality, we can start a, a project of autonomous survival of what is left human. The small minorities that still 
think and act in a human way have to accept the final secession from the, from the final victory of Nazism. This is the point. Obviously, the word Nazism is not uh, expressing the present uh, condition. Obviously, when we use the word Nazism or fascism, we are speaking an old language that is not really catching the problem. What we call Nazism is something much more complicated. We have to understand the new nature of what we routinely call Nazism. Second, we have to create the psychological, political, cultural, logistical conditions for the survival of human communities outside of the destiny of the humankind. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Franco. And uh, well, that's what I wanted to comment when I was listening to, 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 to your inspiring uh, uh, speech. Uh, you know, the, the, the parallel between 1918 as the year which, uh, with which you started, I think is, uh, is a potent one for our today's contemporary age, uh, especially if you think that that was also the year of the Spanish flu, uh, that you also had the pandemic after a world war, that after that you had hyperinflation, look around us, uh, in Italy, in Germany, in, in Croatia, in Turkey, everywhere in the world, uh, uh, you know, the inflation is really rising day by day and the prices and everything. And then you had, first you had D'Annunzio, uh, uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio, I think a very important figure of proto-fascism. Uh, and then you had the Weimar Republic, you know, which uh, was also a combination of explosive energy, you know, which went into all directions. Uh, so the question is how in this kind of uh, uh, situation you can actually create resistance, uh, but I would say that the parallel comes short with 1918, my parallel, which I just gave, I know it wasn't yours, uh, uh, because what you said is, and what Gunther Anders claims, and what we claim to be today is uh, that today we have the tools of destruction, uh, uh, which go beyond the tools of the 20th century. Uh, uh, and I'm speaking mainly about the nuclear threat now, which didn't exist in 1918. Uh, so our situation today, as you say, uh, 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 is pretty complex. Uh, and I would turn to Edge now uh, to give us uh, uh, hopefully a sort of uh, imagination in which the directions we could go. You know, I think what is really important today, and that's why I'm glad that both of you are here, that uh, we are not speaking about political economy, we're not speaking about geopolitics. What we're speaking about today is the psychosis, the depression, uh, uh, the uh, recreation of fantasy, recreation of imagination, hope, uh, and in which way we can fight the depression and, uh, uh, and the melancholy of today. So, Edge, uh, could you provide us some ways in which we can approach these questions and topics. Uh, first of all, uh, happy anniversary, Progressive International. You've done a great job and you are still doing a great job. So uh, salute to everyone who's been part of this big uh, network. Uh, and secondly, I, I'm so happy to be with Franco and with you today. Uh, on this anniversary. Uh, Franco said something uh, that caught my attention. Uh, he said our intellectual intention should be uh, determination to reverse this fatalistic ideas. So this is pretty much in line with what I am planning to tell today. As you know, I've been going around the world uh, to tell the people that fascism was approaching with its new costume. This, uh, this version is a very colorful one, uh, one and almost entertaining. And it was already in their living room. I was trying to show them that the rise of fascism was global. My argument was simple. Uh, fascism is already seated in the, at the core of the neoliberal system. And as the system crumbles, uh, its violent nature surfaces. Uh, as we all know, uh, this is not a uh, crowd pleaser uh, when too many people are selling the idea that democracy can hold without social injustice. 
when I was telling people about fascism and how they're going to be suffering from it in the West as well, I was sure that once the people were convinced that this is a global matter, it would become evident that international solidarity was crucial. As soon as they saw what was coming at them, I was expecting them to ask, so what are we going to do together? But instead, <laughs> the question was about hope. After some depressing silence in every audience, they all asked the same question. So where is hope? After several repetitions, the question became so annoying that I started asking back, what if I say there is hope? What would you do differently tomorrow? Or what if I say there is no hope? What would this change in your political action or the lack of it for that matter? But the you know, reaction to my question was always in the form of a question again from the audience to me. Are you a pessimist? As if the history is interested in my personal perception of it. Uh, but then I started thinking the question of hope is not only irrelevant, but also inconsequential. Fetishizing the word hope replaces the sense of agency with the sedating effect of being helpless spectators of the inevitable apocalypse. And more importantly, it might be that the apocalyptic uh, zeitgeist might not be producing this need for hope. It might be the system itself that is pumping out the idea of hope to us so that the business can go on as it has been. Because nowadays, <clears throat> if you take a walk on any commercial street in a European capital, you'll see that every ad advertisement from cosmetic companies to energy moguls is embellished with the slogans of change the world, be the hope. I'm not even mentioning the business world trying to mass produce hope by appropriating the youthful energy to use it in the good work for a fix in the system. Now and then even the higher echelons uh, of capitalism in Davos sound like they are secretly infatuated with socialism. And I'm thinking perhaps they see what is soon coming at them, a rebellion or a social explosion, and they are already trying to shape the course of events by domesticating the future through the word hope. It is them, and on the side there is us. And we are also asking for hope. Even among those who dedicated their lives to change the world, People, asking, people are asking about hope. Where is hope? It's the same question. But if you are talking about resistance and apocalypse, I think it is not the word hope that we have to deal with, but we rather have to deal with the word faith. Why? Because according to the neoliberal liberal understanding of humans, we are meek and evil creatures competitive, selfish, greedy, eternally unsatisfied. Due to this false definition of human beings, we don't need a meaning to life and our actions are not much different from a carnivorous nature documentary. This dog-eat-dog dog dog art story of humankind has been imposed on us for several decades for so fervently that we may have forgotten that we are also creatures who survive by creating beauty and creating beauty through solidarity. I think our ability to believe and to believe none of the less is damaged. Thus, our resin death for political action is tarnished. A specter of cynicism is almost haunting our conversations, muting us 
when we are talking about the solutions. And I think that depression actually comes from this muting specter. Uh, I believe that the future of the planet and politics will be about this emotional and political question as much as it will be about class struggle. We have to make a deliberate choice to believe and to believe none of the less uh, in ourselves, in humankind and in political action and in togetherness so that apocalypse can be pushed away at least a little more. And I agree with uh, Franco, our intellectual intention, and this is the most important moral duty of the intellectual today, our intellectual intention should be talking about the faith in humankind, not the domesticating hope of the mouthpieces of the system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elja. This was exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> and I'm mentioning hope again. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's really important to deconstruct hope in the way uh, you just started to do. Uh, I actually quite, I'm inclined to the concept which Terry Eagleton coined, you know, when uh, he speaks about hope without optimism, uh, uh, showing that, you know, uh, usually hope is connected with optimism. And that's what you say, you know, what we have today in contemporary global consumerism is that there is even hope beyond apocalypse, uh, uh, you know, whether it's on Mars or it's in electric cars, with, which are supposedly going to change everything. It doesn't matter, but uh, you're right. I think that hope itself is losing uh, or it never had it, actually, uh, this kind of subversive uh, 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 revolutionary potential, you know. Uh, uh, I think instead of hope, you mentioned faith. Uh, 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 what I would mention is imagination, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we have to go beyond the current dystopia in the sense of reimagining, uh, 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 but which already means rebuilding uh, uh, the world, uh, which we want to see, you know. Uh, because I think very often... Uh, in today's world, what we also have, besides this kind of consumerism, commodification of hope, is also a what I call a commodification of the apocalypse itself. Uh, you know, that the end of the world uh, is becoming uh, a product itself, you know, from very literal examples uh, before the pandemic and before the war in Ukraine. Uh, uh, you know, I traveled to Chernobyl, for instance, uh, in order to investigate how this kind of dark tourism looks like. And it were thousands of people going to Chernobyl, buying T-shirts uh, uh, and souvenirs, you know, vodka from Chernobyl, air from Chernobyl and so on. And you can see that, you know, at this kind of horrific place, which is Chernobyl, uh, which is this kind of collision between the nuclear range and climate catastrophe and war, you know, it's you have all three of them. Wildfires in Chernobyl, Russian troops occupying, now they left as far as we know, uh, and uh, you have a potential new catastrophe. And what you had before the war, before the pandemic, was already a commodification of the apocalypse. And I think that's also dangerous because it kind of uh, paralyzes our imagination and our emotions, you know. Uh, recently, I, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, humans are strangely funny beings. I don't know what Franco would think about this. We are, you know, uttering this word, apocalypse, end times, uh, in order to make them uh, aware that they need to do something. We are trying to uh, give the message of urgency when we use these words. But humans are funnily strange beings because there, uh, there is a certain deliciousness of this uh, end of times because end of times removes tomorrow and that is the ultimate freedom you don't have to do anything mm. anymore you can be comfortably helpless and the moral consequence would not be uh, you know this would be not wrong morally because there is the apocalypse so i think the system is already uh, in a very sneaky way this dominant um, discourse uh, is creating this addiction to apocalypse yeah uh, a very tiny um uh anecdote not an anecdote but a uh, observation i wrote one book telling people that fascism is coming they're going to die everything is will be horrible and so on if they don't do something 
I remember the eyes of the people, uh, the mesmeration. They were almost hypnotized. But then I wrote another book, uh, and I thought this would be the way out. I was offering them something new, fresh, and hopeful if you're a fan of the world. Uh, and I, I, I noticed that the, immediately the audiences leaned back, they smirked, and they uh, almost looked like these philosopher kings who are about to deliver judgment on my ideas. Suddenly they were detached. That hypnotization, that mesmeration was not there anymore. And they weren't enjoying as much as they did when I was doing the Cassandra talks, like, you know, everything is going to be horrible talks. So this apocalypse is a very, very dangerous word. We're using it to do something else, but the consequence of it might not be what we uh, are looking for. Yeah, if I may, before I, I, I give the floor to, to Franco, just comment on what you said. Uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, you have the commodification, fetishism, addiction to the apocalypse, uh, which, of course, has to be understood as a revelation. It's not the end of the world. Uh, uh, on the other hand, when you try to provide a kind of uh, constructive uh, 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 way out, uh, uh, then it very often, as you say, the audiences go like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's that's a utopia. Uh, you're making yourself silly. What are you talking about? Uh, you you're know, naive. that we, you're naive. You think that we can abandon fossil fuels? Just look what's happening with the current war. Fossil fuels are back, and then we have we will have fracked gas in Europe, and so on. Uh, uh, you know, this is the kind of problem in which we are today. And then my question is, uh, uh, how can we go beyond it? You know, how can we? Uh, not to how can we go beyond the trap of being afraid of utopia uh, or what Foucault would call heterotopia, which means creating a real existing utopia already today. Uh, and my answer would be again, uh, you know, the field of the semiosphere, to put it like that, the, the, the sphere of science, uh, uh, the, of meaning, creation of meaning, narratives. Uh, I don't know whether the both of you watched. There was this nice TV series recently, science fiction one, uh, called Station Eleven, uh, with Gal Garcia Bernal, uh, uh, one of the actors. And it's basically a series which was shot before the pandemic. And then it was stopped by the pandemic. And then they continued to shoot it. And it's a series about a post-pandemic world. Might sound boring. You know, who would wa want to watch another series on the pandemic in the times of a pandemic? But it's quite interesting because what they show is that the post-pandemic world, after a much disaster, more disastrous pandemic than COVID, uh, goes into a kind of pre-industrial stage. So there is no technology anymore. And the kind of people who are showing a way out or who are helping the other people to confront themselves with the trauma of the end of the world are the people from theater, from art. So in the TV series, you have a traveling symphony who are traveling around horses are pulling the cars because there is no fossil fuel uh, uh, and they go around and make theater plays and they kind of provide a new meaning, a new narrative. Uh, and I think this is the question which I would now oppose to Franco. Uh, you've been dealing with this, you know, for, for decades, you know, uh, on the one hand, criticizing, analyzing the semiosphere, the, the sphere of the construction of meaning, of science. Uh, 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 and today what we have, of course, in the 21st century with technology, with social networks, with artificial intelligence and then, you know, fake news and so on, uh, is that it really, the semiosphere really became the predominant sphere. You can see it with the war as well, uh, where you almost have a feeling that the war itself kind of shifted to the war in the semiosphere, the war on social networks, of course, that's not real war, but it produces effects of war as well in reality, but also in our side. So, Franco, how do you think that we can create this kind of reimagination which would lead us out of the pretty bleak situation which the three of us described? And do you agree with Edge that it might be some sort of faith? You know, first of all, we should imagine the, the evolution of um, the present uh, war, 
Hmm? We are talking uh, of, uh, of a situation that is marked uh, by fragility of uh, the, the social body, a, 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 a physical fragility of the social body produced by the pandemic, which is physical and uh, also psychological. Mm. And we are dealing <coughs> with uh, a catastrophic war whose effects uh, are horrible on the ground in, in the Ukrainian uh, territory, but are the, 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 uh, whose consequences are coming everywhere, are coming to Italy, to Europe, uh, uh, to Africa, and so on. I, especially, I think about uh, a phenomenon that has been called the, the, the supply chain disruption. The pandemic has provoked a disruption of the supply chain in many points of the world. But the war is multiplying the effect of of, uh, of disruption of the supply chain. Uh, every day we learn about a new detail of this uh, of this disruption. For instance, yesterday I read that uh, uranium will be lacking in the world because it's mainly produced in Russia. And we know about the energetic uh, supply chain. We know about the food supply chain. So let's try to imagine what is going to happen in six months, in one year. That is uh, the landscape that we have to imagine. All our... Uh, 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 talk about apocalypses and so on that I have been uh, uh, cherishing so much uh, in the past years. All that is, is just metaphor. So we have been dealing with uh, pretty metaphors. Uh, now it's reality, not metaphor. So What's going to happen when the social effects of this disruption are going to deploy in Europe, in Italy? I think to the Italian situation in which the government of Mario Draghi is perfectly suited to impose a, 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 a general uh, a poli policy of uh, um, against workers, against uh, social life, in the impoverishment that we have been experiencing in the past uh, 10, 15 years uh, is going to deepen enormously. This is the condition that we must uh, imagine, first, first of all. At a certain point, I read in the American press about the great resignation. The word resignation uh, uh, came to my mind, to my imagination after reading that 4,500,000 workers of America have decided not to go back to work after the, the, the pandemic collapse. Wow, interesting. I have tried to, to imagine that the, 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 the strategy of resignation uh, becomes a political strategy of those who refuse war, who refuse uh, the 
the, the, the economic and social oppression and so on. Resignation, an interesting word, because you know, first, resignation means uh, the Christian acceptation of the will of God. This is resignation in an Italian vocabulary and also a French and also an English vocabulary. But the English vocabulary is uh, richer, is more rich, because resignation does not mean only accepting the will of God, which is interesting, but frankly speaking, I don't know what should I do with the will of God, being an atheist. So the second uh, exception, the second meaning is more interesting, going away, abandoning the game, refusing to accept the idea that we must absolutely do those things, working, uh, uh, consuming, uh, um, and so on and so on. A third meaning of the word resignation comes to my mind, which is resignification the resignification of everything in, in my life. What do I really need? What am I uh, expecting from, from uh, social life and so on? So uh, my, my job in the last two, three months has been talking with very young people in their 18, 19 young students in order to understand what do you expect from life? Do you really, really need to buy a car? Do, do you really, really need to live in a, uh, mon a nuclear uh, house, uh, in a nuclear farm? Do you really, really need to have children? Do you really, really need? And so on, resignifying daily life. This is not uh, the, the utopia of uh, a sort of uh, uh, communist Franciscan in, in the manifold meaning of the word uh, intellectual. No, it's not my utopia. No, it's uh, an urgent reimagination of life because we are going to, to live in, in a situation that has nothing to do with the modern promise. Resignation means forget about the modern promises. Forget about it. Then, if you want to survive, you have to live in a way that nobody would have imagined in the last century. This is my, my point now. So we have a big job to do, <laughs> I would I say. We, we have a task which is bigger than any previous generation. The alternative uh, is Elon Musk. A, one out of thousand human beings will be saved going to Mars. We all will die in the nuclear. Uh, you know, the alternative is transhumanism or Saint Francis. Edge. <laughs> Going to Mars with Elon Musk sounds really depressive and dystopian to me, by the way. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm going to pick up from where uh, Franco left. Okay, there is this, I, I, I see it as well. There is this uh, massive removal of consent from the dominant system. The people don't, do not want to work. The young people, especially, uh, they aren't. They do not have the values that we had growing up. That I had growing up uh, in 1980s. 
uh, they are not believing in that if you work hard uh, kind of promise of the system. The system cannot uh, make them believe anymore. And this is a global matter and this is going to have consequences as Franco mentioned. So there is a vacuum, vacuum of values, vacuum of uh, a reason to come together. So what is the new language? What, is, what are the new words? This is what I'm thinking about uh, when, I'm, when I think about resistance, apocalypse, after apocalypse especially. Okay, whatever uh, will happen, either in the form of big explosion or, you know, hellish wars and so on, there will be an after. So, or there will be now and after. So in this now and after, what are those new words that are that are outside the dominant, uh, you know, discourse that are that are outside the destiny of the planet, as Franco put it? So I'm thinking about those words, and I'm thinking about faith, faith, love, dignity, friendship, uh, and so on. There are certain words that have been co-opted and monopolized by religion. I think the resistance, any kind of resistance, should be today thinking about those words and re they, they should be after reclaiming those words from the realm of religion to the realm of politics. Because these are core values, because these are very close to heart, these words, they cannot be uh, they are beyond and above the political uh, frictions and factions and so on. So I'm thinking about faith in that sense, to have faith in our kind. Franco, being, uh, you know, you spend more time on this planet than we did. Uh, so probably you remember better than I do that in 1970s, there was no word of hope. I mean, like people were not obsessed with hope. They were doing what they had to do. They were in the action. So the words had a meaning, actually. And these words that today are co-opted and monopolized by evangelists and so on, such as love, kindness, and so on, that was already in the action, or they were trying to bring those words into action. So I am thinking about these words and I am thinking about this new vocabulary, which are actually made up of old words, very, very ancient words. Can we use these words to deal with the current situation so that we can build a future? Faith in that sense is not at all religious, not all a religious concept to me, but an ability, a skill of the humankind that can help humans to create beauty and to survive by creating beauty. And when I say beauty, I mean political beauty, I mean togetherness, I, know, I, I mean the joy of togetherness. When I use these words, people react to them, uh, especially joy, faith, uh, kindness, love, and so on, thinking that these words are already done with, they are rotten, they are already uh, in the realm of religion. But if we can put these words back into politics without, be, without the fear of being considered naive, which is an important problem in today's political uh, realm, uh, then we can maybe start from scratch. In this, in this, in now and in the future. Uh, yeah, this is what I had to say, actually. <laughs> yeah, I could, if, if I may, uh, I, I could agree with your point and, and uh, you know, determination to save faith as such and to focus on faith and to use faith in order to get beyond the apocalypse, uh, but only under one condition, if it's credo cui absurdum, you know, I, I, I have faith because it's, absurd. I have faith in the humankind because it's completely absurd to have faith in them. Uh, so I think this kind of faith, which is aware that we are dealing with a very contradictory situation and that we have to go beyond the mere facts which show that uh, human values 
might as well be Chernobyl, Hiroshima and Auschwitz as well, you know, that a human is a very complex and humanity itself, uh, 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 it's a very complex system, actually. Uh, this kind of faith, I think, would be important so that, uh, which I think then could be coupled also with a sort of what Franco was talking about, resignification, you know, creating new meaning, you know, because... Uh, you know, you, we need the absurd, I would say. We need the joke as well, if you want. We, know, we need black humor. We need the recreation of words, which you had, for instance, uh, in surrealists, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, or what the Russian futurists were doing, you know, this kind of uh, uh, hacking the language itself, you know. Uh, I think, so at the end, we're coming to an end, unfortunately, uh, uh, although the end already happened. Uh, uh, I would just leave the floor for, for final words to Franco and you, and then we'll see each other at some other time after the end at some other place. Franco, do we want to comment what uh, no, Edge just said? And just, maybe. Uh, um, you quoted Tertullianus, uh, the credo, credo qui ab, absurdum. And credo qui absurdum is a uh, a theological affirmation of the existence of God, but it can also be a, a very humanistic affirmation of the strength of life, of pleasure, pleasure. You know, desire, the, the, the intensity of the flesh, the intensity of, of my wish, to meet uh, your body, the, the body of a friend, the body of a lover. This is my fate. But uh, when it comes to hope, well, I dismissed this word many, many years ago, maybe <laughs> since the beginning. I, I replaced the word hope by the word expectation, which is much more materialistic and uh, understandable. What is expectation? Uh, it's uh, a frame of uh, intentions, a frame of desire, a, a frame for my desire investment what I expect from the future. So, in that frame, what do I expect from myself, from my friends? What are my possibilities? Uh, this is the crucial point uh, at the political level, to change our expectations in a way that is not necessarily uh, having less, renouncing, no. Uh, the problem is, uh, what do you think is your pleasure, your happiness? Can you change your, your, your tools for, for obtaining your happiness? Can you change your, your way towards your personal expectation? This is the point. What do we expect? from the future and what we expect from ourselves. Thank you, Franco. I think that's a very important final point that we never forget, actually, these questions, which very often seem to be missing in progressive struggles, to put it like that, or at least a discussion on these topics, uh, dignity, love, uh, expectations, desire, pleasure, is very often missing. And I think the more we speak about it and approach it in the ways the both of you did today, uh, the more useful it might be for some future struggles. Uh, so I'll pass the word to Edge for a final word, uh, and then we have to stop, unfortunately. Um, I was so happy to be here today with you and Franco. Um, it opened my mind. So I hope people, our friends in Progressive International all over the world, will feel the same uh, like me today. I feel like saying to them, You've done a great job. You're doing a great job. And please believe in yourselves and believe in humankind. We're going to do this because there is no way, uh, no other way. Yes, it is absurd and it's also beautiful. 
and uh, lots of joy of friendship in Progressive International. Uh, and again, happy birthday to all of us. Thank you, Eja, and thanks everyone uh, for joining us today. I hope we will join and the three of us will meet physically soon. Uh, I'm sure actually into that. And well, a happy birthday to the Progressive International and ciao. Ciao. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the summit at the end of the world on Progressive International's second anniversary. The organization has come a long way and it's impressive to see how much impact it has already made around the world. Now, I'm speaking to you today from colonized Palestine where Palestinians have been consistently resisting settler colonialism in all its manifestations from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea for over seven decades. The Palestinian people remain steadfast in their opposition to the attempts to ethnically cleanse them from their historic homeland. And we salute those who have consistently stood with us. Now, for the last few years, the mainstream media has been talking about the dystopic new reality that the world has found themselves in. Yet this new reality has many characteristics of daily life that marginalized and vulnerable communities, particularly in the global South have long been suffering from. Lockdowns, curfews, failing medical infrastructure, preventable deaths, bombardments, military incursions, and so much more. The pandemic and certain wars haven't become these great global equalizers. Far from it. They have perpetuated and deepened already existing inequalities and systems of oppression. So much so that indeed it does seem like we are coming to the end of the world. So what can we do about it? How can we save humanity and rebuild a better world? One that is built on justice, liberation, and in tune with the environment around us. It starts with our immediate communities and our spaces of political organizing, in our friendships, our families, our professional environments. We have to foster a politics that's simultaneously radical and loving so that we can even begin to tackle the mammoth systems of oppression that work together to oppress the majority of the world's people. It requires us to build an internationalist network in defiance of the attempts to pit us against each other. Remember, we share oppressors, but they are few and we are so much more. Our strength lies in people power and it's time to realize that strength. I don't have to labor the point, none of us have to labor the point that internationally we are facing crisis in democracy. In the processes of democracy, in the process of constitutional democracy, where constitutions exist, and the denial of basic rights to people, including the right to freedom of expression, and not only in the nature of our expression of freedom in words, but occupation of public space, which has been rallying point for all kinds of poor people to come together to make their point of view known to, to the government and to the system. But in spite of all this, I would say that associating with Progressive International and looking at the international struggles has given more strength to the elbow of Indian movements and Indian, Indian groups that have fought against the violation of these fundamental rights, including issues like right to freedom of expression, including issues like places of public protest, the farmers' protest, which carried on for over a year in India, really made a very loud statement about the need for a public space and b that it is determined that a determined that a determined protest in people can really get their voices heard and they can really do it with nonviolence and with in the, in, in the pacifist way that we have done all these years in India. It's a very strong and important statement to make because it's both the issues that were involved, the numbers of people involved, the, the time they took to convince the government, but also the tenacity with which they stood there. And they brought back to India, at least, a sense of democratic well-being. 
And I think apart from that, all the sectarian violence which has taken place and our voices have not been still, we have protested and therefore we have been building up a body of protest to, despite the immense amount of restrictions that have been used and the restrictive policies that have come to be. Internationally, I think associating with progressive international has been very important because it has brought to us a feeling of associating with similar movements all across the world. And though we are nation states and we are ruled by our own governments, uh, democratic, so-called democratic governments, it has been important to feel that international we are a body of people who fight for the same principles and values, and it gives us enough, immense courage and determination to carry on further. I think the last two years have been fairly important years in India's democracy, in our lives for, of, for resistance and protest, for justice and equality. Saludos compañeros y compañeras de la Internacional Progresista. Yo soy Gerardo Torres Zelaya, Secretario Internacional del Partido de Libertad y Refundación Libre de Honduras, ahora eh, al frente del Gobierno de la República bajo el mandato de la Presidenta Xiomara Castro después de 12 años de resistencia y de organización popular. Queremos enviar un fraternal saludo en el marco de la segunda cumbre anual de la Internacional Progresista, la Cumbre del Fin del Mundo. Sabemos que cuando se habla de los impactos del cambio climático, de la pobreza y la inequidad como un problema del futuro, como una amenaza del futuro, eso solamente es posible para los países desarrollados y quienes todavía gozan de varios privilegios. En Honduras, en países como el nuestro, eso no es una cosa del futuro, sino no una cosa del presente. La migración, el impacto, la pobreza, el hambre por cambio climático, por iniquidades y por pobreza es algo que estamos viviendo y que tenemos que enfrentar. Así que saludamos este esfuerzo, agradecemos la invitación de la Internacional Progresista para ser parte eh, como pa partido miembro y esperamos pronto poder estar con ustedes construyendo ese mundo que siempre hemos creído es posible. Saludos y éxito. Greetings from Zimbabwe and congratulations Progressive International on your second anniversary. I hope this finds you well in these trying times. I am Hilary Joe, National Coordinator of the Zimbabwe People's Land Rights Movement, a movement which works with rural and marginalized communities in the promotion and protection of land and habitat rights. As we celebrate the second anniversary of the Progressive International, we call upon all members, partners, friends and allies to add your voices and support for general comment number 26 on land and economic, social and cultural rights under the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights which we hope will give birth to the much needed standalone human right to land, which is key in the reversal of the colonial expropriation of land. Secondly, we call upon your solidarity and support in the call for the removal of sanctions imposed on Zimbabwe, which are causing untold suffering to the people of Zimbabwe and beyond. On behalf of the Zimbabwe People's Land Rights Movement, once again, congratulations on your second anniversary. Together we will build a better world. I thank you. Warm greetings from the Blue Pacific. I acknowledge that these are indeed turbulent times with war, economic crisis and COVID-19 and other multitude issues wreaking havoc across our planet. Yet. For us in the Pacific, climate change still remains the single greatest threat to our existence and continues to undermine our ability to exercise and enjoy our basic human rights. We Pacific Islanders are often perceived as victims to the climate crisis, but I would like to inform you that in the Pacific, there are people who are fighting every day to adapt and mitigate from the adverse effects of climate change. Although, in order to truly address the climate crisis, there needs to be stronger multilateralism to embrace this geopolitical issue on a global scale. 
And I believe that international mechanisms have an important role to play in achieving this. One in particular is the UN principal judicial organ, the International Court of Justice, or also known as the world's highest court. Now, over the years, youth and civil society in the Pacific region have been working tirelessly to request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on climate change and human rights. The question that we would like the ICJ to clarify on is whether states under international law has an obligation to protect the rights of its current and future generations from the adverse effects of climate change. The ICJ, in delivering a favorable opinion, can help catalyze more ambitious climate action by state parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It will bolster the mandates of human rights bodies and raise global consciousness. And finally, the government of Vanuatu has announced last year that it will table a resolution at the United Nations General Assembly this September to request an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. In order for this to be successful, there needs to be a simple majority vote in favour of the resolution. And therefore, I appeal to you all to encourage your governments to join the Pacific this September at the United Nations General Assembly to support the resolution to take the world's biggest problem to the world's highest court. Hello, I'm Ahdef Swif, and I'm sending this from my home in Egypt, where a government that holds 60,000 political prisoners prides itself on the new mega prisons it's building, with borrowed money, the interest on which it has to borrow again to repay. Next door, Gaza is being bombed by Israel in what has become an annual culling. And in the rest of Palestine, Israel works overtime to further displace and disenfranchise the indigenous Palestinians. I look at my other country, Britain, and I see public services cut, racism on the rise, and people in work unable to make ends meet. Three small snapshots of three places in a world in the grip of a system that is predicated on the misery of millions. A system that will, if unchecked, destroy the world. We know that we have to work to put an end to it. We know that we have to act together to think together, to imagine together the different worlds that can be made. What Progressive International has already achieved is remarkable. It has taken informed positions on many of the issues plaguing the world today. It has contributed practically to uh, implementing democracy, and it has attracted a large number of very diverse organizations and people to its membership. The challenge is how to grow global and stay subtle, to welcome and celebrate variety, but remain on course, to act with urgency, but strategically and with deliberation. We need to be able to radically transform the world if it is to survive. Progressive International is well placed to be an incubator for this change, and I look forward to continuing, to growing and to amplifying our work. Thank you. Dear comrades, we gather at a very difficult time, uh, a time when imperialism is redrawing the lines of confrontation in Europe, threatening to drag the whole planet into a nuclear conflict. We gather at a very difficult time when the future of the planet itself is facing a huge risk of extinction with the devastating capitalist policies that have destroyed the environment over centuries, especially the one we're living in. We are gathering at a very difficult time uh, when the counter-revolution is triumphant largely in the region where I come from, the Middle East, with uh, military dictatorships taking over country by country, uh, squashing the dreams and squashing the ambitions of the people who have rebelled across the last decade, 
looking for or searching for bread, freedom, and social justice. But the darker the night, the brighter the star. We have to cling to hope, and this hope is always international solidarity. Uh, let's make use of this gathering today in order to exchange ideas, exchange information about where we come from, but at the same time to try to come up with solidarity campaigns with the political prisoners who are languishing in the presence of the counter-revolution in the country where I'm coming from and elsewhere. Even before the war in Ukraine, Poland had a shortage of at least 2 million apartments and workers' protections were fixed issues. Healthcare and education were in ongoing crisis due to decades of austerity. Right-wing governments, spewed nationalist propaganda, limited women's rights and persecuted LGBT plus people while staying in power by enacting minuscule social concessions. Years of negligence for climate change left Poland deeply reliant on fossil fuels from Russia, thus founding the slaughter of Ukrainian civilians. Since the imperialist Russian invasion of Ukraine began, almost three million refugees have come to Poland. They were welcomed by a grassroots social mobilization but with lackluster support of the state. The new situation exacerbates the old issues. The housing crisis depends. The shortage doubled compared to before the war. Refugees seeking employment are an easy target for exploitation, while employers abuse the situation to worsen the working conditions for all. Rape survivors who came from Ukraine have limited access to abortion in Poland. Moreover, underfunded and overworked healthcare is not capable of providing its services to the refugees. Help and acts of solidarity are increasingly met with violent xenophobic attacks. The foundations were laid by years of anti-refugee policy in the spirit of fortress Europe. While Ukrainian refugees are warmly welcomed, at the Polish-Belarusian border People who are not white enough are beaten and sent to die in the marshes and forests. To overcome those challenges, we need international solidarity and socialist alternative. Um dos nossos objetivos deve ser buscar esforços comuns para que nós possamos enfrentar esta grande chaga este grande dilema da humanidade nos tempos atuais, que é a superconcentração da renda, que é o aumento da miséria, o aumento da fome, a forma cada vez mais injusta que o capitalismo se organiza a nível internacional e nós não teremos uma mudança estrutural dessa realidade sem uma participação efetiva de todos nós, em todos os continentes, no mundo inteiro. Esta é uma causa não de um país, mas é uma causa e um desafio de uma geração. Hello, dear comrades. It is a pleasure to be welcomed in the second anniversary of the Progressive International. My name is Flavia and I am an activist of Organizada Politica in Albania. Over the past year, we have been involved in a national campaign for social and economic justice. Albania is one of the poorest countries in Europe where nearly 40% of its population lives under the poverty line of $5 a day. We have the second lowest minimum wage in the region and no minimum basic income for the most vulnerable. Nonetheless, a few oligarchs control all the national resources of the country and get richer by the day. We named our campaign the Social Charter for a more just society, where we lay out a set of demands that would ameliorate the lives of Albanians if they were to be implemented tomorrow. This is the opening video of our campaign, in solidarity from Albania. Çdo dit, qindra mira vet, qojmë pak dhir dita për të kapra autobuzot për në punë. Pundore Fabrikash 
minator. Mundor nërtimi. Shitse. Buk pjekës. Shofer. Kamarier e pastrues. Gjdo dit, djetra mirë të tjerë qohën të papun, mi disë dëshpërimi dhe shpresës, se deri në darë dhe të shpien diçka në shtëpi. Gjdo dit, rrët 600.000 pensionistë, Grysen duke u menduar 2 herë për para se të blej një frut, një mërësir apo një kilogram mish. Qdo dit, 65.000 familje, për pishën që të shuaj në rinë me më pak se 2 dolar në dit. Qdo dit, një student, që hoqë me dilemë nëse duhet të shkoj në shkollë apo në punë, nëse i nevojtet më shumë dia, puna, apo zidja është një bilet për emikrim. Qdo dit, një të ektar i vogëllë, një zejtar, një i vetë punësuar për balen me frikën e falimentimet. Qdo dit, një njëri i varfër, për plasët në dyrë spitale është të rënuar, bje në burg dhe në dëshpërim, i abuzuar si fëmi, e vrar si grua, i vdekur si punëtor. Qdo dit, një oligark zgjohet me i pasur nga puna e të tjerëve, kurse një punëtor me i varfëruar nga puna e ti. Shqipëria sot, është një adhe i shpronsuar me dhun nga një grusht pushtetarësh dhe oligarkës. Shdo ditë i gjash muajve të ardëshëm, ne, aktiviste organizatës politike, do t'jemi anë e këndës Shqipëris, për të takuar me qytetarë, punëtorë, të rinjë pensionistë, në sheshe, lagje periferike e dyër fabrikash, për të kërkuar dhe organizuar me qëllim materializimin e kartës sociale. Po që është karta sociale? Karta sociale është një përpjekje për punë dhe jetë me dignitet. Da i fëtojmë gjithë qëllëtarë të vënditonë që së bashku përkojë. Minimumi një dik 18.000 lek në muaj, pak minimale 23.000 lek në muaj. Shëndetësi dhe arsim për dikë falas në zitje të kontratave kolektive të punë. Politika të punësimit të plotë, transport publik me të shmim të përbaluashëm, indeksim të pagave dhe pensioneve. Programet të trejimit publik lirë, dhe taksim të vërtet progresiv. Bashkoha mirë! Queridas compañeras y compañeros de la Internacional Progresista, sabemos que una vez más los ojos del mundo están con Chile. Ustedes saben, nosotros pasamos de una dictadura sanguinaria de 17 años con Pinochet a una transición en la medida de lo posible, que basó su eh, bonanza económica en deuda, en despojo, en privatización, en desigualdad y en destrucción del medio ambiente. Ante esa realidad es que nos revelamos en octubre del 2019 con esta gran revuelta popular que terminó con el desmantelamiento de la constitución de Pinochet. Hoy en día estamos en el primer proceso, en la primera asamblea constituyente democráticamente electa, paritaria y con pueblos originarios del mundo. Estamos escribiendo nuestros sueños, nuestras aspiraciones en, la, en lo que va a ser la nueva Carta Magna, eh, una Carta Magna profundamente democrática, que asegura derechos sociales y que nos dota de un nuevo modelo de desarrollo. Sabemos que eso es el primer paso. El segundo paso ha sido el proceso de poder ganar la presidencia con nuestro compañero de Convergencia Social, Gabriel Boric, donde luego de una reñida primera y segunda vuelta logramos la presidencia con, mediante una amplia coalición de izquierdas que incluía del Partido Comunista hasta el Frente Amplio y luego la instalación del gobierno. Estamos luchando porque el programa de gobierno que nos llevó a la presidencia se concrete y que este proceso de transformaciones que partió con la revuelta no pueda ser detenido por ninguna otra fuerza. Venimos del movimiento social, venimos del movimiento estudiantil, de las luchas feministas, de las luchas medioambientales, del mundo sindical, de la revuelta popular. De ahí venimos y no nos vamos a retirar de las calles. Los desafíos que tenemos hoy son muchos, y más que nunca necesitamos el apoyo de la comunidad internacional. En Convergencia Social creemos que el trabajo conjunto de las fuerzas de izquierda a nivel global es crucial para enfrentar los desafíos que tenemos. Tenemos profundos desafíos ambientales, donde no basta con las acciones de un solo país para frenar la emergencia climática. Necesitamos una decidida acción conjunta. Necesitamos también fortalecer las redes de integración regional. Nos urge pensar la solidaridad en América Latina por medio de una red fuerte y permanente que pueda resistir las oleadas de la derecha autoritaria. Y finalmente, Chile también necesita el apoyo de la comunidad internacional para garantizar la reparación y la justicia a las víctimas de la represión política durante la revuelta. Muchos de quienes nos escuchan hoy quizás fueron parte de la lucha contra Pinochet y las distintas redes solidarias en el exterior, 
o también con las redes que lucharon contra la impunidad en cortes internacionales. Los convocamos nuevamente para apoyarnos en garantizar justicia, que los responsables de la violencia policial sean sancionados y que las autoridades políticas del periodo también respondan ante tribunales internacionales. Un saludo compañeros y compañeras de la Internacional Progresista, abrazos desde Chile y su militancia en el exterior.
Muy buenas. Eh, hablar de la solidaridad es una de las cosas quizás más lindas del pueblo cubano. Todos, como, como pueblo, como masa de humanos, tenemos experiencias de la solidaridad. Algunos como maestro, otros como médico, otros como instructores. Pero el pueblo en general tiene una gran experiencia y si no fue personalmente a una misión internacionalista, tiene un familiar. Es, es así de simple, ¿no? Una de las cosas yo creo que más hermosa ha hecho la revolución por este pueblo es el enseñarnos a sentir esa solidaridad por cualquier ser humano en cualquier parte del mundo. Yo no sé si ustedes logran entender, pero es tan hermoso cuando hablo, por ejemplo, con un compañero mío de carrera y, y fue al ébola, fue a combatir el ébola. Yo recuerdo que estando en mi hospital, entonces soy alergóloga pediatra, y un profe me dijo un día, usted va a ver que van a venir a buscar ayuda a Cuba por, para combatir el ébola. Yo le dije, pero si nosotros no sabemos nada del ébola. Dice, no, no importa, pero van a venir, vas a ver. Y efectivamente, la Organización Mundial de la Salud al poco tiempo llega a Cuba y pide ayuda para el ébola. ¿Saben por qué? Porque estaban seguros de que nosotros íbamos a decir que sí. Y fuimos. Los mejores hombres de este país, profesionales de la salud, enfermeros, médicos, técnicos, fueron a combatir al ébola. Y lo lograron. Y eso te da una fuerza extraordinaria como pueblo, de verdad. Porque tú dices, somos capaces. Somos capaces de ir a cualquier rincón del mundo donde somos necesarios y somos capaces de ayudar a otro ser humano. No importa el color de su piel, no importa su religión, no importa ni siquiera lo que piense, no importa. Simplemente podemos ser útiles y lo somos. Eso es una de las cosas más lindas de la Revolución Socialista. Es de las cosas y de los logros que va obteniendo en la formación día a día de los seres humanos. En mi caso personal, como médico alergóloga pediatra, yo cumplo misión por primera vez en Nicaragua. Todavía era un pichoncito de médico. Tendría 23 años. Iba a ser el último año de la carrera. Acababa de triunfar la revolución en Nicaragua y Cuba no tenía tantos médicos como tiene hoy. Por tanto, el comandante en jefe, Fidel Castro, se reúne con los estudiantes de medicina del último año y nos pide que quién queríamos hacer el internado internacionalista. El último año de la carrera de medicina le decimos internado. Y bueno, de mi año, 480 muchachos dimos el paso al frente. Llegué a Nicaragua. Fue una experiencia extraordinaria para mí, porque yo nací con esta revolución, es decir, ya nací con todo garantizado, salud, educación, dignidad, y uno no sabe bien qué significa otro mundo hasta que tú no eres capaz de, de vivirlo, ¿no? de contactarlo. Y la experiencia en Nicaragua fue dura, un proceso revolucionario incipiente, con, por, su, por supuesto, con muchísimas dificultades, como todos los movimientos revolucionarios, pero una gran fuerza de la religión católica influía en dividir al pueblo prácticamente en dos. Y eso era un enfrentamiento también, además de todo el proceso revolucionario. Fue dura, fue una experiencia difícil, porque yo estaba acostumbrada en Cuba a que la salud es totalmente pública, gratuita, al servicio de todo el pueblo. Y de pronto tenía que enfrentarme a médicos que iban al, al público un ratico y después se iban al privado. Y podían dejar a los pacientes tranquilamente en manos inexpertas como las nuestras, ¿no? Y nosotros teníamos que, que crear, que crecernos como seres humanos allí. Y lo hicimos. Fue una experiencia dura, pero a la misma vez muy educativa. Bueno, yo siempre cuento que cuando llegué a Nicaragua, yo había hecho en Cuba dos partos, con los médicos al lado, las enfermeras obstetras, y de pronto voy con mi batica, yo estaba delgadita, de lo más jovencita, y llego a, al hospital, a la puerta, y le digo, doctor, dígame, ¿qué hago? Doctorcita, entre, que hay una mujer pariendo. Y solita, solita me tuve que enfrentar a ese parto. No tenía idea de lo que estaba haciendo, de verdad, estaba nerviosa. 
los planos se me confundían, no, no sabía de verdad. Las primeras nicas que yo hice parto todavía deben estarme buscando por los desastres que hice. Pero bueno, después terminé haciendo 100 partos yo sola, ya era casi un máster haciendo parto. Nicaragua nos formó, no, nos enseñó muchísimo, nos hizo más fuertes como profesionales y más capaces. Después yo regresé a Cuba y estoy trabajando acá en La Habana, pero ¿saben qué? Me daba una cosa porque realmente nosotras como mujeres habíamos salido del país antes de terminar la misión porque Estados Unidos había amenazado con una invasión a Nicaragua. Y el comandante en jefe siempre protegió a las mujeres cubanas, siempre. Por tanto, él dijo, todas las mujeres regresan. Y yo fui una de las que protesté porque a Fidel yo le decía tío, ¿no? Y le decía tío, pero tú sabes el problema, van a quedar los muchachos solos, la mayor parte somos mujeres, entonces va a ser difícil la situación. Pero él dijo, no, 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 hay que proteger a las mujeres y deben venir para el país. Bueno, todas regresamos a Cuba, pero como me sentía un poco mal con eso, me fui a la parte más oriental del país, a Moa. Esa es otra experiencia interesantísima que un día les contaré. Pero después de eso regreso a La Habana, al año regreso a La Habana, ya empiezo a trabajar en el Pedro Borras, que era mi hospital, y de pronto llega la noticia de que hay que salir nuevamente de misión a otra parte del mundo. No te decían a dónde, simplemente decía el hospital tiene una cuota de tantos médicos para ir a una misión. Y bueno, nosotros nos reunimos, analizamos las cosas y en ese momento la única que podía hacerlo era yo, que no tenía ni novio, ni marido, ni hijito, ni nada. Entonces dije, sí, voy. Cuando llego al Ministerio de Salud Pública, provincia de Salud Pública, digo, mire, yo vengo mmm, por el Hospital Pedro Borrás eh, para cumplir misión, ¿dónde me tocaría? Y me dicen, Angola. <ríe> yo había salido de Nicaragua en guerra y Angola estaba en guerra. Y yo dije, ay, mi madre, otro país en guerra. Y la compañera me miró y me dijo, no, no, mire, doctora, si usted no quiere ir, esto no es obligatorio, esto es voluntario. Y yo dije, no, no, compañera, si ya yo estoy aquí, no se preocupe, yo voy a donde sea. Y me fui a Angola. Y fueron quizás los dos años más difíciles de mi vida. De verdad se los digo. Hay que vivir en África, hay que, que sentir lo que ese, esos pueblos han sufrido durante siglos. No, no hay derecho a eso, no hay derecho. Como médico pediatra, además, fue quizás la etapa más difícil, más dura que recuerdo. Porque imagínense que llegar a un niño, una niña como de 12 añitos, viva, caminando, y cuando le hago un análisis tiene un gramo de hemoglobina. Entonces mando con urgencia a pasar un paquete globular. Ay, el técnico se la puso fría y me la mató. Y no pude, no pude sacarla del paro. Eso todavía duele. Porque hay cosas de esas que tú dices, no es posible que un médico tenga que vivir esto en, en lugares así. ¿Por qué? ¿Qué diferencia puede haber entre un niño negro, un niño blanco, un niño amarillo? No hay diferencia. Los niños son sagrados, los niños es lo más hermoso que tiene el mundo. ¿Cómo se arriesga su vida de esa manera? ¿Cómo vive en situaciones tan precarias que cuando tú le dices a una mamá, pero si no tiene cómo alimentar a su hijo, ¿por qué tiene tanto? Y ella te mira y te dice, doctora, es a ver si alguno puede llegar a ser adulto. Es difícil eso. Ahí viví dos, dos epidemias de cólera. Y fue tremendo, fue tremendo. Los padres llegaban con los niños muertos al hospital. No podíamos hacer nada por salvarlo. Caminaba el hospital completo, el María Pía, que después se llamó Josina Machel, de un extremo al otro, tomando venas, poniendo suero. Era un trabajo inmenso. Pero te queda la satisfacción de que algo lograste, de que alguno de esos niños realmente tú lograste salvarlo, o por lo menos ayudarlo. Me puse a trabajar con los niños tuberculosos y, y fue... Fue lo mejor que me pasó también, porque eran niños rechazados socialmente, con la gente le tenía miedo al contagio. Nosotros estábamos bien vacunados, bien comidos, así que 
yo me los ponía en la espalda, como la mamá. El niño le, me veía entrar al hospital, hacer eso, le quitaba el paño a la madre y me lo daba. Y yo me lo amarraba a la espalda, como ella me enseñó, la mamá me enseñó, y le daba toda una vuelta por el perímetro del hospital. La sonrisa de Celson era de oreja a oreja. Simplemente por eso era feliz. Y eso me dio ánimos para seguir y fuerzas para seguir. Pero en Angola aprendí cosas muy importantes y básicas para el ser humano. Hay que luchar contra todo lo que sea racismo. No, no puede justificarse de ninguna manera. Nada, ese sentimiento hay que borrarlo de la faz de la tierra. Y lo otro es el colonialismo. No, no puede ser de ninguna manera, de ninguna manera aceptar eso. Los pueblos tienen que tener el derecho a vivir su propia historia, su propia vida. Ese continente africano fue expoliado, explotado, no solamente mineralmente, no solamente su tierra, sino sus seres humanos, que fueron llevados a otro continente como si fueran simplemente animales de carga. Esas son cosas horribles en la historia de la humanidad y que hay que borrarlas, hay que, hay que por todos los medios impedir que cosas así se repitan en el mundo actualmente. Por eso la solidaridad entre los pueblos tiene que ser cada día más grande. Hay muchas cosas por hacer, hay mucho pueblo por ayudar. No ir a imponer nuestra cultura ni nuestra gran sabiduría, no, aprender de ellos. La vez que yo pude contactar con las parteras quichua en el norte de Ecuador, aprendí lo que no había aprendido con esos 100 partos en Nicaragua, no, aprendí lo que no hay escrito en ningún libro, porque es sabiduría ancestral de nuestros pueblos. Entonces hay que aprender a escuchar. Y la solidaridad no solo te permite crecer como ser humano al sentirte útil a otro ser humano, sino que también te permite crecer desde el punto de vista de sabiduría ancestral. La cantidad de conocimientos que nosotros hemos recolectado en todos estos años es extraordinaria y es gracias a esa acción. Por tanto, ser un médico internacionalista es saldar un poco la deuda que tenemos con la humanidad. Y creo que esa es una de las cosas más hermosas que logramos hacer. Después de eso seguí trabajando con Movimiento Sin Tierra en Brasil, que es mi movimiento, yo soy miembro de ello. Trabajé también con una fundación eh, argentina que se llama Un Mundo Mejor es Posible. Y, y con esa fundación conocí de verdad al pueblo de donde es mi papá originario, ¿no? es decir, él es argentino. Y, y ahí aprendí de verdad cosas de ese pueblo. Estuve con los mapuches, estuve con los guaraní, estuve con los estudiantes de medicina que se formaron en el AM, porque eso es una cosa preciosa que ha hecho también la revolución en los últimos años. La formación de médicos, de profesionales de la salud en una universidad latinoamericana, totalmente gratuita. Es, eso es un sacrificio enorme desde el punto de vista económico para este pueblo, pero es grandioso. Es realmente grandioso, son las ideas brillantes de nuestro jefe. De verdad que son cosas hermosas que hacen que uno se sienta muy orgulloso de ser cubano, de verdad. Y allí en Argentina, trabajando con estos muchachos, yo me sentía como la gallina con sus pollitos. Es lindísimo poder ver eso, es lindísimo poder tener el orgullo ese de mi pueblo ayudó a ser mejor a este profesional, mi pueblo le dio lo mejor a este muchacho y hoy es un gran médico, un buen médico. Eso es extraordinario y lo hemos logrado. A mí me tocó el honor de trabajar con un grupo de ellos en Argentina y de verdad les digo que, que ha sido maravilloso. Y así hemos trabajado en distintas partes del mundo también llevando un poco el mensaje de solidaridad de nuestro pueblo, pero a la misma vez aprendiendo, aprendiendo mucho de la necesidad del amor entre los seres humanos, de la comprensión, del respeto entre nosotros. Si no existe eso, no podemos cambiar este mundo. Y hace mucha falta, es muy necesario cambiar este mundo. No podemos seguir viviendo así.
Friends and comrades, welcome to the summit at the end of the world. This panel is called Can Democracy Defeat Fascism? I'm Varsha Gandikota Nalutla from the Secretariat of the Progressive International. I'm calling in today from India. If you look at the situation around here, where we have a right wing government in power, journalists that criticize the government for any of its policies are routinely thrown into jail. Municipal corporations are used to bulldoze over Muslim households in neighborhoods across Delhi. It's happening right now. And political leaders from the opposition are spied on using technologies like Pegasus from the Israeli firm NSO. Let's travel further south to, say, Sri Lanka, where the people of Sri Lanka are facing an acute fuel shortage. Anti-government rallies, there's been tear gas deployed against them by large police forces, and towns like Rambukana are streaked with blood. Travel for the West towards Kurdistan. Turkey's offensive in Kurdistan continues with the full support of NATO forces. Elsewhere in Europe, if you look at parties like the AfD in Germany, they've been routinely using Nazi-era rhetoric against minorities and against refugees. And you see this once again in places in Latin America, where, say, in Colombia, which is going to its elections right now, pro- candidates like Gustavo Petro from the Pacto Historico, the, he's a pres- progressive presidential candidate, is giving his campaign speeches using bulletproof vests and surrounded by armored shields. I, I don't mean to paint, you know, start this panel by painting a bleak picture of the world. But I say this because right-wing forces across the world are using a variety of techniques. The right really knows how to be creative, how to be insidious, in the ways in which um, it u- ways in which it suppresses democracy. But there's also alarming similarities across all of these places, from Manila to Ankara, from Budapest uh, to Delhi to uh, Sao Paulo. So the question for us as internationalists is, what are progressive movements that are fighting against this repression doing right? What are we doing wrong? And most importantly, how can we unite in our struggles to defeat fascism? For this discussion today, I'm delighted and honored to be joined by Harsh Mandir from India, Tuba Syed from Pakistan, and Dilar Dariq from Kurdistan. I'm going to quickly give you their bios. I couldn't possibly cover all of their accomplishments and the many different struggles to which they lend their support. But I'll briefly give you their bios. We are joined by Dilar, who is a political sociologist and a feminist writer. She organizes with the Kurdish Women's Movement in Europe and holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Cambridge. She's also an author of the forthcoming book. I'm really excited to read this book, Dilar, The Kurdish Women's Movement, History, Theory and Practice. We also have Harsh from India. Harsh Mandir is a human rights uh, and peace worker, writer, columnist, researcher and teacher. And he works with survivors of mass violence, hunger, homeless persons and street children. He's currently a Richard Wan Weizsäcker Fellow of the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin. Welcome, Harsh. And finally, we're joined by Tuba Syed from Pakistan. Tuba Syed is a feminist researcher, writer and left-wing political worker associated with the Awami Workers' Party and the Women's Democratic Front. She has been involved in movements related to civil and political rights, housing rights and the feminist movement in the country. She's currently working on her first book with co-author Zoya Rehman called Feminist Visions of Justice in Pakistan. This is a terrific. We have two incredible feminist books coming out soon from our speakers in today's panel. Thank you so much for joining us, Harsh, Tuba and Dilar. I want to start with you, Dilar. Tell us a little bit about what's happening in, Kur- in Kurdistan right now. How is the Kurdish women's movement organizing in resistance? What are the struggles of resistance against Turkey's offensive and NATO's offensive exist in Kurdistan right now? Over to you. Thank you so much, dear Varsha, and uh, much respect and many greetings to the fellow panelists. I look forward to hearing from you. Um, so I should start off by saying that we're in the midst of a war uh, situation in Kurdistan. Um, just a few weeks ago, the world's attention, of course, uh, started to focus on the war in, in the Ukraine. But the Turkish state, which is the second largest NATO army, has seized, meanwhile, the opportunity to launch yet another military campaign. Uh, as part of its occupation concept in Kurdistan. And this new cross-border uh, operation comes ahead of the elections in Turkey. And this is to incite nationalistic uh, sentiments and to create a sense of unity uh, ahead of the elections against a perceived threat, which is usually Kurdish. And um, the current war is extremely dangerous. And for the Kurdish freedom struggle 
and especially the Kurdish women's liberation movement. This is also an attack on its uh, revolutionary achievements over the past decade. So I want to stress, first of all, that this is not just about um, an ethnic group and its uh, demands for uh, independence or anything like that. This is above all really about ideology, because in the Kurdish freedom movement and also wider democratic oppositions in Turkey, people are defining the Erdogan regime as a fascistic one because the Turkish state at the moment especially represents a deeply authoritarian, a deeply patriarchal, conservative, neoliberal and Islamist agenda. And in recent years, it has launched several military operations and campaigns domestically against the Kurdish movement, but also beyond its borders inside Syria and Iraq to target the Kurdish political struggle. And the Kurdish freedom movement is not just an, uh, a movement that is for the rights and the self-determination of the Kurdish people. It's also a liberation movement that has a much more universal claim for uh, sovereignty and uh, liberation beyond the nation-state system. It proposes uh, concepts like world democratic confederalism. Its focus on women's uh, autonomy has now been widely acknowledged. And it's a very popular and very popular actor in the region. And it's also a transborder movement that is meticulously organized beyond the Middle East, inside Europe as well. It's important to stress that actually the Kurdish freedom movement is actually one of the most um, widely and well-organized mass social movements inside Europe as well. But it's also very much a criminalized one. So in our perspective, we see the uh, AKP's regime's wars in the region, its expansionist policies, not just inside Iraq and Syria, but also in Libya, in Armenia and elsewhere, which is done also through Islamist mercenaries. And at the same time, it is, of course, a NATO army and it's an EU candidate. This is an attack against political alternatives, against uh, struggles, against the solidarity of peoples that the Kurdish freedom movement, together with other progressive democratic organizations and movements in the region, have been trying to advance. So we call this a genocidal and feminicidal, and we can also add an ecocidal war that serves NATO interests. And at the moment, there is not much atmosphere to talk about the war crimes and human rights abuses that are being done in the umbrella of NATO. But basically, inside Syria in particular, the Erdogan's led state has been uh, de facto allied, not de facto, directly allied, which makes it a de facto ally of NATO with radical Islamist groups, remnants of Daesh and Al-Qaeda. So um, all of this, of course, has to be read in context. I know I don't have enough time to explore everything, but in 2015, the peace process between the Kurdistan Workers' Party and the Turkish state collapsed. And this war has ever since left uh, after a period of hope of really a genuine kind of prospect for justice after decades of war. Uh, thousands of people were killed. Thousands were jailed. Thousands of people, of, uh, of people went to prison. And among them are many women. So we really stress that this is a patriarchal war also against the women's liberation movement in Turkey and Kurdistan and beyond. Uh, elected mayors and MPs are in prison and people often focus on them. But we have currently tens of thousands of people who are political prisoners and so many of them are women. So the Erdogan's ideology and the, and the um, allies it has in the nationalistic uh, movement, the MHP party is, is part of the coalition government. Uh, th this is an attack against minorities, against uh, ethnic and religious minorities, against youth. There's uh, resistance in universities in Turkey, which is being cracked down upon. Many people may have heard about that as well, against workers. The domestic situation economically is horrible, and everything is being blamed on some kind of conspiracy outside. And the discourse that is used is that one flag, one nation, uh, one religion, against all the diversity of the colors of the country. And of course, in the last couple of years, especially 2018 and 2019, there have been several cross-border operations um, and currently occupations that are still ongoing that displace hundreds of thousands of people inside Syria, mostly Kurdish. And this was an attack on what we call the Rojava revolution, which is now in July going to celebrate its 10th anniversary, which was built on the ideas of the Kurdish freedom leader Abdul Öcalan, who's in, in prison in Turkey since 1999. So all of these concepts that people have come to hear about, women's liberation, ecology, radical democracy, that the movement has been developing in a mass fashion in several countries, including in Europe, they're all under attack. And Öcalan is currently being uh, isolated. We don't have any news from him, but he's the main interlocutor to return to the peace process. And leading human rights organizations are behaving politically by not picking up on his case, which amounts to torture according to international law. So at the same time, 
I want to wrap up, but I want to say that um, there is also massive resistance on all fronts. So inside Rojava, inside Syria, Kurdish women especially have been on the forefront of resisting these policies together with Arabs, Syriac, Circassian, Turkmen, Armenian women. Inside Turkey, there are broad feminist coalitions and also generally progressive coalitions against the regime. Uh, there have been crackdowns against women's and LGBT organizations in Turkey, and people are connecting these things, the attacks on the women's revolution in Rojava and the withdrawal of the Turkish state from the Istanbul Convention and so on. There are mass campaigns inside Europe. And at the moment, there are coordinated mass protests inside Europe, everywhere against the latest military invasion. And I want to stress here the significance of media and information because there are nonstop across uh, the European continent, so many mobilizations, internationalists, some of whom have come to Kurdistan and come back. So they see really this movement also as a political perspective beyond Kurdistan only. They see that this is a defend, that, that this is not just about defending a territory or one people from something. It's about defending people, that f resisting against fascism. But the media is deliberately not reporting about these protests. And that's because European governments, above all Germany, UK, France, are directly supporting this war. It's a NATO-led war. It's a war against a political alternative. And this is because the movements have been building across borders, solidarity alliances. People who have been in solidarity with Kurdistan are also people who are in solidarity with Palestine, are also people in solidarity with other struggles and who resist the war machine in general. So by cracking down on people who are in solidarity with Kurdistan, the European states are trying to evade their own complicity and responsibility in the war crimes that are being led by Turkey. So it's important for people to really understand the role that the Turkish state and its current fascist kind of makeup plays for the advancement of very dirty interests, of very strategic interests of Western states uh, and NATO countries in general uh, in the region and beyond. So I think I'll stop here, but I just wanted to say it's not just attacks, it's not just war. There's also massive resistance and it needs to be uh, supported through like a genuine, very strong, powerful internationalist solidarity. And I think women really are at the forefront of leading that struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dilara. You're absolutely right in pointing out kind of the bias in media. A lot has been said in recent weeks about, you know, what they're calling NATO's other war, especially as we stand in solidarity with Ukraine. But we see nothing, almost zero coverage in European papers on really in media publications across the North Atlantic about what's happening, uh, led by NATO armies in, in Kurdistan. So I want to turn to you, Harsh, now. We know that repression is on the rise everywhere, from Ankara to Manila, from Budapest to Delhi. We know that state actors are cracking down on activists and journalists, artists, unionists, really across the board to kill off dissent. But there are, as Dilar has pointed out, there are efforts to defend our movements, to challenge persecution and, you know, under the broader frame of protecting our democracies. What's the situation in India? And I know you've been embroiled in many of these struggles personally and otherwise through the organizations that you work with. Tell us a bit about what's going on. So thank you, Varsha. Um, uh, let me just start a little bit about the threats to democracy. India's, in uh, seven and a half decades of India's freedom, I don't think democracy uh, has ever been uh, as threatened as it stands today. And there's too little awareness and even less solidarity uh, uh, with, the, with the struggling people in India. Uh, and uh, so let me talk a little bit uh, about the nature of the crisis. India's democracy was never perfect, but even with its flaws, it was robust, vibrant, colorful, assertive, with largely free elections, uh, a, a largely independent uh, judiciary and press, uh, strong and assertive political oppositions, and a vigilant civil society. This is, these are things that we took for granted. Uh, but we've reached uh, a place in the journey of our republic uh, when democracy has been, you know, never been as hollowed out and as threatened. Uh, the threats are many. Uh, I'll talk about uh, two or three uh, in, in, in the limited time that we have. I think uh, what is most troubling probably about India today is, uh, is, is almost an open war by the state against India's religious minorities, uh, specifically uh, India's Muslims and uh, India's Christian populations. Um, Muslims constitute uh, 200 million people, uh, 
it's the second or the third largest collection of Muslim people in any country. Uh, but they are a minority uh, in this country. Um, what is their, you know, what is their, you know, what is being contested is their right to equal citizenship uh, in this country of ours. Um, there were two, you know, it's a battle that goes back at least a hundred years. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, led our freedom struggle with an idea that we would create a country uh, uh, which would be humane and would be inclusive, would be uh, equal, would be just, um, and in which people of you know, different religious identities uh, uh, would be equal citizens in every way. Um, and uh, but. Uh, the present, uh, the leadership uh, of uh, of India today, belongs to uh, a formation of Hindu supremacist ideologies that were opposed all of these hundred years to this idea of uh, of of an inclusive uh, country of equal citizenship, and uh, with the kind of um, electoral backing that they have, uh, they have launched. Uh, what is clearly like an open uh, war against India's Muslim people. Um, you know, there's hate speech, hate attacks, uh, the epidemic of lynching, uh, and even more troubling, uh, there is uh, the surrounding silences around it. Uh, this is a really a social project which, in which runaway hate speech normalizes, legitimizes, valorizes hatred and bigotry. Uh, and this hate speech is led by uh, the senior leadership. Uh, but it is also a social project uh, which is worrying because it seems so easy to have radicalize larger and larger sections of people. So, uh, you know, for instance, uh, if uh, girls wear, uh, wear a hijab to school, they've been doing so. Uh, for decades, suddenly that becomes an issue of nationwide protest. Uh, uh, people are performing their prayers in the open, suddenly that becomes an issue in which people gather. So there's this, there's the social project, there's also the official project of rendering Muslim second class, uh, uh, you know, a whole range of legislative measures, and the changing of uh, India's citizenship laws themselves. Uh, which discriminate against India's Muslims. Um, there's the official campaigns that criminalize interfaith marriages and, uh, and so on. Uh, there's, uh, there's also a political project of rendering India's Muslims uh, uh, more or less electorally irrelevant by uniting everybody else across caste and across religion against this perceived uh, enemy. Um, and there's also, you know, side by side, I'd just briefly like to talk about uh, the other threats to democracy. There's a crushing of dissent in politics, in civil society, in academia. Uh, there's been the uh, jailing of, of, of people of uh, high uh, integrity and credibility. Intellectuals, activists of, of, uh, are being held for years without trial. Um, but... Also, civil society is being you know, criminalized. Uh, NGOs are finding it harder and harder to find funding. Academia, the university, the, the liberal left university is being destroyed. Uh, uh, and uh, we also see a hubris uh, also of highly centralized, opaque decision making that abandons the poor, particularly uh, visible in the pandemic. And all of this has happened because of the enfeeblement of all institutions, the Election Commission, the higher judiciary, the civil services, the media, the Human Rights Commission, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, I, I, like, uh, you know, like you asked, I do think that we need to, to underline that whereas all of this uh, causes worry, uh, it is the darkest place that our republic has fallen into. Uh, uh, we still see signs of hope and resistance. And these have taken many forms. Uh, most dramatically, we saw uh, uh, the citizenship laws, which, which uh, for the first time discriminated against, gave different uh, and lesser rights uh, to undocumented Muslims as compared to people of other identities. 
people across the country in universities, in colleges, but also uh, uh, in different... For a hundred days, we saw a protest where Hindus, Muslims, and people of every identity came out. Uh, the constitution became the icon of the protest. Uh, the national anthem uh, and the national flag, which reflects this diversity, uh, you know, were, were used as icons of protest. It was a, an exhilarating time, uh, but that was crushed and uh, the uh, we saw the farmers protest that went on for more than a year uh, and on and in in smaller ways we also see resistance uh, illustratively when uh, when uh, people protested against people coming out and and, and praying uh, doing their namaz uh, the Sikh gurdwaras uh, said you know if you have a problem you don't have mosques to pray uh, come and pray. Uh, people opened up their homes and factories. So there is resistance of, of, of many kinds that still give us hope. Uh, I'm in Germany these days looking at the 1930s and I, you know, one can only take hope from the fact that there is far greater public resistance to the targeting of minorities uh, uh, than, uh, than we have seen before. And uh, it is solidarity with these movements uh, across the world that I think will give them strength. Thank you, Harsh. I want to turn to you now, uh, Tuba. You know, we just spoke backstage about you know the crisis that's currently underway in Pakistan, and how movements are struggling to kind of suddenly cope with um, you know on the electoral terrain with state power kind of coming to a standstill. So, if fascism is indeed on the rise, you know, across the globe, and is very clearly, evidently, as Dilar has mentioned and Harsh have mentioned, you know, as a force prepared to use violence and upend the rule of law, how should this strategically inform? Um, our struggle for democracy and how would you see that, say, in Pakistan? Um, thank you, Varsha, for inviting me and for having this conversation. I'm, I'm really glad um, we're having this conversation at this moment because for many of us, this, this has been a very um, worrying time in Pakistan. And I was just noticing when Harsh was, um, he was speaking and he was saying this is probably the first time that Indian democracy has been threatened, um, you know, like this. And um, I was thinking about my own country and I realized that uh, for us, Pakistani democracy has been threatened like this forever. Um, we've never had uh, a democracy in the country where it wasn't interrupted uh, by majoritarian, authoritarian rulers um, from the military establishment. And very recently, um, we had a democratic, um, you know, a democratic setup, a democratic prime minister, democratically elected prime minister, uh, who's who's um, actually replicated exactly the same ways that the that we've suffered in the past at the hands of military dictatorships, um, and 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 it it it's it's almost like um, you know it's almost like this has become the fate of a country like Pakistan where we see that democratic institutions have never been really strengthened, and as a result, um, we we see that people have lost faith in all kinds of democratic institutions in the country. And every few years after the you know, military takes control or military dictatorship, we, we see a populist leader appropriating um, the language of people's politics, appropriating the slogans of the left, uh, whether it was Bhutto in the past or Imran Khan right now. Uh, we've seen how they continue to mislead people uh, and also use a very specific narrative of, of telling at this, you know, having this victimhood narrative while at the same time telling people how not to believe in the state institutions, which they are supposed to represent uh, and believe the this cult follower leadership that they have in front of them. And I think that's that's become a constant struggle for Pakistan right now. We have thousands of young people who have no hope, hundreds and thousands of people um, who on the one side have dynastic politicians, which obviously have failed us multiple times. On the other hand, we have hybrid regimes of the sort that Imran Khan had. And it's been it's been a very difficult time for um, the general masses because on the one hand, we see Imran Khan pushing an anti-imperialist narrative or picture to the, to the world at large, while at the same time, we see him subjugating his own country and its people to imperial subjugation um, and using the same kind of tools against 
against you know the political workers and the political activists in the country however in the last few years we've also at least in the last five to six years we have seen multiple uh, movements people's movements in pakistan whether we talk about the pashtun tahfuz movement the women's movement in pakistan the students movement we've continuously seen that the pakistani people are are still resisting are still willing to resist despite all the different kinds of betrayals and crushing of dissent that's happened in pakistan and that's that's really the only thing i feel we can really do um and i've i've learned this from the resilience of the people of my country um who've not just been you know ruled by military dicta dictators but also um you know abducted they're missing they've been um killed um their leftist leaders of the past who were hung at city squares in this country so i feel like this is really uh for me i think this this kind of resistance and struggle uh which the people of this country and especially the young people of this country are putting up right now and are also um look towards india and of course like we we might be few in numbers because that's the thing with populism uh they're always more popular with the people but i feel the the kind of resistance we see in our countries is is the only hope and of course um a lot of inspiration that we can all take uh, from the way the kardish movement is going and uh, the way they approach internationalist politics um and you know how uh, i mean my organization has also been in touch with kardish women's movement and it's it's primarily them taking this initiative and i think for is especially for countries like india and pakistan which are neighboring and kind of suffering i think india we often joke in pakistan and say india is becoming pakistan but probably at 100x speed uh so you know it it's very important that we share these practices we we speak to each other more often and i think that's something really missing in our region right now especially given what's happening with sri lanka um i really think there needs to be a greater cooperation be cooperation between people like ourselves who are were struggling were resisting um and I i'm really glad uh, for that that this conversation is happening today and i hope we can take it forward thank you ruba i want to pick up on something that you said which i think is really important for the situation in all three of these countries right you talked about imran khan kind of wielding this anti imperialist rhetoric for example and we've seen that from modi we've seen that from erdogan we've seen that even from bolsonaro or duterte right but anti imperialism without kind of any material commitment to socialism we've seen of course that always risks becoming a kind of reactionary ideology in and of itself and slips into its own brand of fascism so i want to ask two kind of related questions and maybe i'll go to you harsh first and then to dilar which is to say how should we understand fascism as a framework in this point in history do we need a new frame you know differentiating it from mussolini's times or double down on the um on the word and on the terminology itself with a kind of more flexible reading and how do we understand this kind of claim to a certain post colonial language that's used but wielded by all of these neo authoritarians and if if as movements we are strategizing against it how might we build internationalism in response to that so maybe harsh first to you and then to the lar the i think i think there's been a this too much discussion about whether fascism is the correct word to use uh, and i think we're losing uh, uh, what we're seeing is something that is that has many thing many things in common with fascism but european fascism was a particular uh, uh, sort of uh, process that happened in a particular historical time i think what we're seeing is definitely fascistic uh, if if that helps um and has uh, uh i'm seeing comparisons between what is happening in india in the last 7 or 8 years and uh, and and what happened in germany in the 1930s before the holocaust actually set in and it's uh, it's extraordinary how how many similarities there are uh, where you you identify a particular uh, minority within the country and you demonize them with hate speech which is led from the top full of bigotry uh, uh and uh, and it is legitimized at every level uh there there's uh, hate attacks which which become part of normal life you attack their uh, their livelihoods uh, in multiple ways uh, you criminalize interfaith uh, 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 relationships uh you uh you, you rewrite history 
to demonize uh, and, and, and change their, their role. You, you change the names of roads and cities to sort of eliminate them and erase them from, from a common history. You change citizenship laws which somehow suddenly reduce them into, uh, in, into non-citizens. Uh, all of this and, and, and much more uh, is something that has happened. Uh, we've watched it happen in Germany. We've seen the consequences of it. And we're seeing it happen in different ways in, in our countries uh, around the world. Uh, and also in the countries uh, in, in, in the global north. And I, I think that we need to not uh, uh, you know, reduce what Trump, uh, what he did and he's doing to, uh, to American politics. Uh, Le Pen and, uh, you know, that she she got a substantial uh, segment of, of the French vote. So we're seeing it across the world uh, where I think it's become more, there's never been a time as dangerous as it is now for many decades to be a minority of any kind. And I think that they made it harder and harder to be different uh, and to still hold your head high, uh, to look different, to worship differently, to to speak a different language, to eat differently, to love differently, and so on and so forth. So, so whether you call it fascism or not is a matter of, uh, you know, is a quibble that I think we can do without. Uh, and what we're witnessing is is, is extremely dangerous uh, to uh, to the ideas of of uh, equal citizenship, to the ideas of of uh, of uh, uh, justice and freedoms uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that, that that's one thing that we need to... And uh, uh, it is extraordinary how similar is, uh, is, the, is the approach uh, that uh, so-called populist leaders of the right are, are following across the world. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, whether uh, uh, the... Uh, the framework of international uh, solidarities is important. Uh, I think we need to stand much more strongly with each other. Uh, just speaking about Tuba in Pakistan, it's extraordinary. And she was talking about how how quickly uh, we are sort of rushing and hurtling towards uh, towards becoming like Pakistan. I think there's something. Uh, uh, very fundamentally uh, profound in what in what she said, because the idea of India, not its practice, uh, but the idea of India was that uh, we are safe, you know, if only if we respect uh, each other's uh, as we are in, in our differences. The idea of Pakistan was that we are safe only in our samenesses, and that the samenesses is only defined. Uh, in terms of your religious identity. And I think that they, that these are two competing ideas, not just in our subcontinent, but across the world. And I think that the idea that we must, uh, that we are safe only, not by being like each other, but by respecting, uh, 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 truly respecting, and in fact celebrating the fact that we bring uh, so much diversity together, is an idea that we need to promote. There's a new imagination, I think, uh, of, of, of the world that we will leave to our children. Uh, there's an economic aspect to that, uh, to that imagination. What kind of economic system do we need to think beyond neoliberalism is very important. But also how do we deal with, with difference? And I think that uh, being comfortable with uh, the fact that your neighbor will look differently from you, eat and dress differently, worship differently, speak a different language, uh, but is, is as much your neighbor, uh, as much as a part of your larger collective and family, is an idea that I think we need to, to grow into the international discourse. Thank you, Harsh. Dilar? Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Harsh, also for your uh, comments. And I just want to thank everybody here, really, for all of the remarks and really uh, I know, that, as Tuba mentioned, there have been uh, interactions, communications across our movements, and I think more of that needs to happen. So I think we all agree on that. 
And um, I think, you know, in the case of Erdogan, for example, he's a very typical example of somebody who uses, as Varsha, you mentioned, this uh, logic of we are under attack, there are these foreign conspiracies against our country. And yes, of course, the, between states, there will always be uh, conflicts and clashes, but blaming everything that is a difficulty, a problem inside Turkey on on outsiders is a, uh, that's the origin history of the Turkish state, you know, which was launched through the Armenian genocide, which is still denied inside Turkey, um, and many other genocides and massacres against uh, ethnic and religious minorities. So unlike what happened in Europe and the context of fascism there, there are past episodes of large-scale genocide or, or uh, mass displacement and massacre and atrocity that have that are still taboo to talk about inside Turkey. So that's why I think um, when we speak about fascism in the context of Turkey, it's to see that there has never been uh, a reckoning of what happened in the past and how these legacies continue to uh, shape the discourses and the possibilities and potentialities inside Turkey. And um, so the Kurdish question is one example of that and the Armenian genocide is an example of that. So I think at the same time, Erdogan, of course, is trying to uh, present himself as a model leader, especially for the uh, Islamic world, uh, for the global south, for the region. He has huge ambitions inside Asia, inside Africa. And uh, these are very sinister because the language that he's using in his, in his meetings uh, with other heads of states or, um, you know, especially through the language of Islam, are very different to the language that he's using domestically and the very different from the language he's also using with the West. So he's really trying to pitch himself in different ways to different um, constituencies. And unfortunately, oftentimes it is working because Turkey, as I mentioned, is a very powerful ally of the West. And it's often a bridge to other regions uh, in the world for Western state interests as well. And for example, the solidarity that the AKP regime often expresses towards the Palestinian cause means nothing considering the strategic, economic and political relationships between Turkey and Israel. Uh, so it means really absolutely nothing, but on the level of rhetoric, it works. It works for um, to, to kind of confuse people uh, in these different contexts. So in, in our movement, in the Kurdish women's movement, we have a definition of fascism that tries to connect different systems of power to each other, specifically the state and patriarchy and capitalism through longer term histories as well. And so we do not see fascism as being disconnected from capitalist modernity and its mentalities, its legacies of colonization, of, of ecocide, of feminicide. So in that sense, in the last 10 years alone, if you look at all of the systems that have systematically targeted, especially Kurdish women, we can name NATO in it, we can name um, authoritarian states in the region, we can name groups like ISIS in it, and we can also name uh, Kurdish patriarchy. So these are all things that have very similar uh, mentality. So we talk about mentality really when we talk about fascism. It's not just, it doesn't have to reach the level of a systematic, basically like a system as what happened in Europe in the past where there was a very clear one line and one system and one whole government and economy of it. Fascism is also a methodology that is used to varying degrees in different uh, moments in, in countries' histories and increasingly methods are being copied and replicated and oftentimes, as Harsh and Tuba have also mentioned, the victims are often the same. It's the youth, it's women, it's minorities, it's oppositions, it's differently thinking people. So it's really a methodology, but it's also uh, a system of thinking, a way of relating to life. So in that sense, I think... Um, if we are facing new forms of fascism in the 21st century, which have connections to the past, but also have new uh, kind of variations, they adapt to the new context, social media, internet, everything plays a big role in how fascism is organized today. But also, really, we need a new form of internationalism that is not just through states, that is not just confined to national borders, that is not so 
um, heavily kind of elitist or male dominated. It really has to be a, a bottom up kind of internationalism between struggling movements. And this is what we call in the region and in our works here in Europe as well, people's diplomacy or women, the women's movement calls it strategic alliance building. So how can we also have our autonomous ways of resisting that is not just protest, that is not just critique, because there's a limit to how much we can critique in protest, but really actively organize common fronts, actively work together, actively not just issue statements of solidarity when something happens, that's important, but really beyond just the spiritual I am with you kind of thing that is very important, of course, but uh, how can we really, really resist the prison industrial complex and the way in which it works everywhere, the war industry, the arms trade, um, so all of these things are together, so I think this is what um, you know, these kinds of conversations can really do, but they need to translate into organized uh, uh, forms. So we try to move beyond this language of solidarity also, but and say really we need new common fronts, struggle fronts. And I think uh, really the most, the ones who are most affected by these forms of fascism, they need to be the new revolutionary subjects also of, of the struggles we have to lead in the 21st century. Thank you, Dilar. I want to come back to, you know, what you raised about the new revolutionary subjects and kind of these special projects that would actually translate into tangible projects of um, internationalism across these struggles, right? And I think this relates to two kind of parallel things that we see in all of the countries that we've been discussing, which is one part, um, a deterioration of social fabric, you know, the ideas of hate just proliferating, um, intolerance for any kind of difference. But at the same time, what's also happening is a kind of breakdown of institutions like the judiciary, like the media and kind of takeover, whether that's by billionaires and corporate power or by kind of small but determined right wing forces, very often with the endorsement of the right wing governments that are in power. But before that, I want to kind of also step back and think a bit about electoral terrain as a as a terrain of battle. And Tuba, maybe I'll start with you. You know, if you look at right wing forces across the globe, where the, you know, the hard right of fascist forces have been defeated at the ballot box, most recently, of course, you can think about, you know, France with Macron's uh, victory or Biden in the US, Pedro Castillo in Peru, Slovenia, Italy, we have yet to see what happens in, in Turkey, of course. Where the fascist forces have been defeated, it's not been by left or progressive political movements, but really by still problematic alternatives, right? By neoliberals um, or barely uh, or essentially centrist political parties. As you study the world, do you think that this delay is kind of, does this delay a greater struggle to come? Or would you think of this as a first sign of a successful reversal in this global fascist tide? I, I honestly, um, I, I think it's it's very important that democratic institutions in all these countries are strengthened. Um, and I also believe they have a reciprocal effect. I feel like the democratic institutions are strengthened by these fringe movements or the leftist political workers. I, I, I don't think it, it happens in some sort of vacuum. Um, I also feel like a lot of this space, especially in, in, in a country like Pakistan, space for other democratic institutions or democratic political centrist political parties is made by the work of people like myself or people who are on the left, who actually make the real sacrifices for, for, you know, for the reinstatement of this. We have seen time and again that in Pakistan there has been dictatorship. Uh, dictators have come into power and it's never happened that after the dictator we've seen a revolution or we've seen a leftist government take power we've always seen a centrist party or the same old dynastic party come into power but the struggle has always been done not just by those parties but mainly by the leftist political workers it's it's always us who come to defend their rights uh, to you know political freedom to political association to have a free and fair election i and i i do feel like it it might not be end all be all but it it's it's definitely a means um, to reach where we want to reach because in Pakistan really the only hope for us is the the whatever weak democracy we have because I believe weak democracy is always better than 
um, strict di dictatorship. Um, at least, you know, when I look at my country, this is the lesson we've learned. And it, it's still possible to push and hold democratic governments uh, accountable. It's still possible to push against those forces, um, you know, who, who, I mean, in Pakistan, we've had various... Uh, movements who are borderline fascist um, even currently the you know the Islamist right-wing groups organizing themselves at the behest of the you know by the support of the deep state we can say or the military for that matter but we still see that there's still space um, for us to fight and can um, you know even contest elections we've seen some um, in one part of Pakistan we've seen a uh, MNA who's actually won elections uh, from from the PTM movement, which is uh, labeled an, an anti-state movement. And I feel like um, for, for countries like ours, that really is uh, one of the first steps that we have to take. And I, I do understand why it might be difficult in countries which, which have a more functional democracy and yet it doesn't work. But I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of a country like Pakistan where uh, we still are trying to strengthen that democracy um, because to find space for our movements, to find space for our struggles. And I do feel like that, um, and obviously that, in my opinion, that's not the only way, but probably one of the ways. Uh, the other ways are the ones which, you know, Dilar um, very beautifully just spoke about, that we have to go beyond um, this politics, you know, the, the kind of international politics we're really doing um, these days, which is, you know, really just releasing statements or saying we're with you in spirit. It, it has to be some sort of actual real ground grassroots politics where we are connected, taking action together, organizing together. I think that really is the need of the hour. And for the longest time, there has been a very, very large vacuum in internationalist pro-people's politics across uh, the world, not just in our regions. And I feel that's very, very important. Um, and I'm, I'm really worried uh, for the last few years, given what's happening in South Asia and that not even happening within the South Asian region. Um, and, you know, I think that that is what we really need to focus on because the problems when when I'm hearing Dilar speak, I really can't tell if she's speaking about Pakistan or Turkey. I mean, uh, what the leaders are doing there is exactly what the leaders are doing here. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there, there are lessons that we can learn from each other. There are strategies that we can share. There are strategies that we can build together, create together. Um, and I think beyond fighting for democracies, whatever uh, sham democracies we have in our country, uh, countries is, it is really looking beyond the post-colonial nation state um, and, you know, going for that kind of solidarity, which we really want to see in our part of the world. Thank you, Tuba. You know, both of you talked about these projects of internationalism and the scope for these projects of internationalism across across all of our countries. Um, Harsh, I know you've worked, you know, on the streets with mainly with unorganized labor through the pandemic you've worked with uh, those working living on the streets with homeless people with with a lot of kind of women's rights organizations i want to ask you you know when we think about making solidarity more than a slogan which is also a motto of progressive international it's something that dilar spoke about very passionately i i'm reminded of um, you know projects like workers in durban refusing to load arms right dock workers refusing to load arms onto ships because they know they were going to israel mainly to be deployed against Palestinians. So we think about concrete examples like that. Worker power and peasant power, traditionally, for all of us leftists, of course, but for internationalists, that's been the big question. How do you build an internationalist alliance of worker power or peasant power? And you're, of course, you know, in, in India, we've had the big farmer strike, again, again, against corporatization of agriculture, against big agribusiness, something that farmers in Pakistan are struggling against, something farmers across the global south are struggling against. And similarly, if you think about, say, something like Amazon, workers and warehouses, they're, you know, oppressed across all of our countries, right? So if we were to link this, you know, the struggle of democracy against fascism with the kind of struggle for socialism, for workers' rights, for peasant rights against capitalism, where would you see these potentials? How might our countries where, uh, play a kind of central locus in, in these international struggles? So I'll turn to you first and then maybe go again to the LAR. So, Varsha, uh, yeah, thank you. I uh, wanted to sort of applaud and echo both Dilar and Tuba uh, on many things that they said uh, just now. Uh, it is true that uh, that people's, uh, people's struggles in what we call civil society, people's movements, actually, if there's anything that is, that is a real opposition to 
both neoliberalism and uh, fascism, it doesn't come from the organized uh, political formations in most countries. It comes from people's actions. And it is, you know, many of these struggles seem small in size, but it is in their imagination and in the way they play out. Uh, I saw the free farmer struggle uh, in, 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 in India. And what was extraordinary about it, there were many things that were extraordinary about it, but for, for where I come, you know, how you can fight uh, with extreme courage and resolution, but without a language of hate. Uh, you know, it was really you, 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 there would be kilometers and kilometers of farmers camping through, you know, winter, summer, rains, uh, but always, you know, reaching out, smiling. You couldn't go 10 steps without somebody saying, you know, come and eat with us. There were young people who were, you know, taking care of uh, old people and looking after them. Somebody had sent up, set up a small clinic. Somebody was teaching children. Somebody was, you know, how do you fight? You know, you have to live this solidarity. You have to fight with this solidarity, uh, and I think that that is what what we need to do far more consciously. Uh, you know, how do you fight? You can't fight hate with hate, with your own hate. Dark. You know, that's something that Mahatma Gandhi used to say. That if you, you know, uh, fight darkness with with your darkness, it only get more dark. So how do you fight? with great courage, with great resolution, with ideological clarity, but in, in ways that reflect uh, your beliefs. What is the kind of society you want to build is how you should fight. And I think that's, that's what we need to learn uh, and with each other. And, and through that, the national and the international solidarities will grow. The, uh, you know, the farmer struggles and the anti uh struggles were two times when I saw these solidarities between, uh, you know, worker, farmer, uh, student, uh, homemaker, uh, you know, uh, people of this identity, that identity, it happened in an organic way. And, and I think that's, that's, that's what we really need to build. Uh, so that's one quick thing I want to say. But I did want to make a point uh, about, the, you know, the profound, almost universal global failure of the formal left parties. To fill up this space, you know, uh, why are they becoming more and more marginal at a time when, uh, when there was, you know, uh, never a greater need. I mean, neoliberalism is really at the heart of, 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 of the of the crises that we are facing, and yet the left has become more and more marginal in in country after country and. Uh, in, in, in Bengal, for instance, in India, but I'm seeing it in Germany here as well, uh, where, where the former left has become. It's not only that that is happening, but the, uh, but the cadres of the former left are moving not even to centrist parties, but to the far right. You know, And that needs to, I mean, uh, since we all come from broadly a left perspective, I think we have to have something has gone very fundamentally wrong in how the left has fought its politics. Uh, and I think that, you know, if, if I was, if I built, you know, built a cadre together with a socialist imagination, I could get disillusioned with the left party, but I couldn't go and join a fascist party. So clearly we were, we were, we were doing something very, and it's happening here. I mean, the, the greatest support for uh, for the AFD in Germany is, is, is in East Germany uh, uh, from people who... who, who and, and so I think that we, we need also... So one part of it is, is the way we fight our battles in, in society needs to reflect the, the values of fraternity and equality and, and so on. But on the other hand, we do need to talk to our left comrades within formal political parties that please understand how are you going so history will not forgive uh, the former left for for uh, for failing to play its role when it was so desperately needed uh, in the world that we are facing today thank you harsh that was very very eloquently put i want to see if tuba or dilar want to come in on this before i go to the next and maybe final comments I just um, just want to uh, conclude with saying that I think 
I think it's it's really useful what we're what we're doing today. Um, and I, I also feel that there's a greater need today, just like Harsh spoke. Um, and I am part of also part of a formal political party. And um, I, I do I, I do understand where this critique is coming from. And this is something uh, we all need to think about that. Why is it that the people who should be on our sides are not on our side? And I think while we, we can blame and we can talk about what, how the populist leadership works and how populist movements work, at the same time, I think it is a moment of reflection for the left world globally and especially for countries like ours where the left is really small and with time we see it becoming more and more marginalized. And I think it's a, it's something I, I'm taking back from this conversation and I would definitely uh, be reflecting. And this is something we continuously reflect on. And I think um, it's in, in Pakistan, um, we've also noticed that there's there's a growing number of young people whose language and whose ambitions and how they view politics in the world is very, very different than how some of us in the traditional left, at least we not, I think our imaginations of um, the world are pretty similar, just the articulations are, uh, are very different. And I think that we, we need to find that language uh, with which we can actually speak to people and connect with people much more. Um, and it, it has to do with, you know, uh, going beyond the traditional forms of organizing, going beyond the traditional forms of movement building, and also creating our own small utopias, uh, however they might be possible. And I think this is something we're working on in our communities by working with the communities. And I um, I come back to the, you know, the Kurdish women's movement and their model of the cooperatives and how they have taken that forward. And I think that's something really the left globally needs to think more and more about, that there are needs of the people which have to be met beyond, um, you know, just slogans or powerful words. Um, and I think those are the kind of material basis that we need to create in our countries and work towards and, you know, share that information with each other to make that reality possible for all of us. Thank you, Tuba. That was beautiful. And we shall let you go now, and then I will turn to uh, Bilal and Hash. But thank you so much for your time and for being here today. Um, okay, so I think we'll do closing comments now. I see we're already close to the hour mark. So, Dilara, I want to turn to you to ask, um, you know, about two different kind of questions, right? One is, of course, about projects like cooperatives, but also about feminist organizing across the world. There has long been talk of a feminist international and of the woman as, um, you know, the revolutionary subject. The many different projects, whether that's the wages for housework movement or withdrawal in any form from household labor, for example. And then there's the question of alternate institution building. And on this, Harsh, I want to ask you as well. And, you know, both of you talked about media and it's one of the central pillars, of course, both of democracy, but also attack on the media uh, that all of you mentioned as one of the central tenets and markers of fascism. So what are the ways in which what are some alternate institutions that we should be thinking about building in both as national projects, but also when we think about internationalist organizing. So closing comments from you, Dilar, and then Harsh. Thank you so much, Varsha and Harsh and uh, Tuba. Really, this was such an uh, amazing conversation, and I think there's so much that we could still uh, talk about, and much solidarity, really, to everybody and their struggles. I think um, it's important for like, from our perspective, because Kurdistan is also divided into four, and there's a huge diaspora living in Europe, for example. This is just by nature. It's a trans-border, transnational movement. So we uh, have so many different struggle conditions. The situation is different in different places, and there are different minorities living there. There's a situation of women. So um, it kind of presents itself, even the geopolitical fragmentation of Kurdistan presents itself to a decentralized, uh, yet trans-border and internationalist form of politics. And the project that the Kurdish Freedom Movement proposes for that is called Democratic Confederalism, which is based on autonomy that is um, accepting the fact that there are these violent nation states and their nationalistic projects that are often targeting groups like the Kurdish people and their very right to exist, let alone uh, democratic rights uh, enshrined within constitutions. So in that sense, uh, this paradigm that has been built, especially since the beginning of the 21st century, is one that is like that is not statist in nature, that does not claim 
only um, to it doesn't first of all claim um, an independent Kurdish state anymore, but it's rather to build different non-state forms of autonomy that can uh, resist and negotiate with the existing states. So on one hand, there are, for example, legal democratic political parties, for, for example, the People's Democratic Party inside Turkey that are inside the parliament, that have municipalities, that participate in elections, and they have a massive popular appeal, especially in the region, in the Kurdish region. Um, but they are also, of course, under attack. Um, the municipalities have been seized in the last couple of years. Many elected uh, politicians are in prison. So there is authoritarian crackdown on that front. But parallel to that, also the building up of uh, communes and people's assemblies, which are, of course, labeled by the state as separatism. But inside uh, Syria, a similar system has been on the in the making where different ethnic and religious communities have been brought together through representative institutions, but also at the same time, neighborhood-based councils and cooperatives. And the women's autonomy is the main principle here. So for each commune, there's also an autonomous women's commune. There's a system of co-presidency because we believe that without uh, dismantling patriarchy, we cannot dismantle power. We cannot resist the state without a free and uh, liberationist movement of women or a general wider movement that is also led actively by women. So the women's movement does not just consist of individuals who participate in any given structure and they just happen to be women. We have an organized autonomous women's movement which does its own uh, outreach work, its own community work, it has its own media. So we have not just the media system, for example, that is separate from the state, there's also women's autonomous media uh, infrastructure inside Europe, but also in Kurdistan. And this is very important for our consciousness raising efforts, for the social projects of the movement. So what I'm trying to say is this principle of autonomy that is also on one hand, of course, able to resist state power, to try to do change within the system, for example, by trying to change the constitution of Turkey, which is still based on the military coup constitution of 1980, and but at the same time to build alternatives outside of that. So not to invest your entire energy into uh, being part of the system and then having a sense of representation inside of it, but also having your autonomous uh, infrastructure. This applies to the work that the movement is doing inside Europe. There are in the individual countries, people's assemblies in the towns, in Berlin, in Hamburg, in Frankfurt, in Cologne, in Germany, for example, in the different cities, there are people's and women's assemblies and an autonomous youth movement. So these relate to each other in a confederal manner they have an umbrella within Germany and there's a Europe-wide ger uh, confederation. So we have within our own movement a, an internal democracy that is based on confederal bottom-up decision-making. Of course, in times of crisis like this current war, there are certain things that are being done in a coordinated fashion, but this is the strength of this movement. It's one of the only entities inside Europe that can, within hours, rally across Europe in different metropoles, mass demonstrations, even if the European media refuses to report about them, they are still happening. So I think it's about capacity building that does not surrender expectations to the state, that does not uh, believe that, you know, for example, having a, a progressive leftist or left-ish government. For, I mean, the Germany, I'm glad Harsh mentioned it, is a very good example. There is right now a new government. It's no longer the Christian Dem uh, Democratic Party of Angela Merkel, but the strategic interests will not change, even if the government does. There is a foreign minister in Germany that is now claiming to do a feminist foreign policy, and she has just recently now, just a few days ago, uh, basically endorsed uh, the, the strategic uh, interests of, for example, among other things, uh, continuing cooperation with the Turkish state, which is, as I mentioned, leading a feminicidal war. Women's organizations and activists are actively criminalized, actively killed. There are drone strikes being committed on women's gatherings in different parts of Kurdistan. Women leaders are systematically being targeted by the Erdogan regime's policies. Um, and yet this is supposed to reflect a feminist foreign policy on the part of the German foreign minister. So, so these are scams. This is like very 
certain liberal um, imaginations that promise or they capitalize, as Tuba also mentioned, they appropriate the language of the left, but they drain energy. This happened in the UK as well with so many young people losing hope after uh, what happened in uh, the aftermath of the, the Corbyn uh, movement. So in that sense, we say negotiation and struggle to understand the state and its power to resist it, but also to not believe in it, to create an alternative system outside of it, to, to build economic, political capacity. And we call these forms of self-defense because police, the states, whether it's the army in, inside Kurdistan in, in Turkey or here in Germany, for example, where uh, or in the UK and other countries where the movements that we have are actively being criminalized, actively being surveilled, deportations are happening on a regular basis and increasingly more. We need to be able to defend ourselves. And this cannot happen by just expecting something from election cycles every couple of years. So in that sense, I think this also lends itself to a new form of internationalism, which is why we in the Kurdish women's movement are proposing also world women's democratic confederalism, which is different from large umbrella alliances that meet every five years and discuss the current state of the world. We want to come together to organize from the ground up uh, things that we have in common, for example, struggling for the freedom of political prisoners, struggling against the arms trade and things like that. This is going to take a long time. This is going to take a lot of energy, but it can only happen through these kinds of um, alliances. We cannot just expect to get protection from, from any state system. So I think I'll stop here. Uh, and I think I am hopeful, even if it's not possible sometimes to be hopeful because there are all these dangers, all of these risks. Uh, but we have nothing um, that we can do otherwise and be hopeful, but not based on illusions, but based on faith that our communities can organize and bring uh, our struggles together. Thank you, Dilara, and thank you for the note that you ended on. I think Ala Abdel Fateh has this note about to despair, you know, is treason to our own movement. So that's the definition of uh, treason that I think we can accept and continue to push ourselves to be optimistic with all of our struggles. Harsh, over to you to close us out. So, um, you know, I could keep listening to Dilara and Tuba, actually. Uh, I think they were really eloquent. I, 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 uh, I really valued everything that they said. I'm also conscious that we're running out of time, so I just wanted to bring in one uh, one more note uh, while agreeing with uh, uh, much of what has been said. I also think that one of the things we need to do together is uh, is a new imagination for our world. Um, when I was in college, uh, when I was perhaps your age, Varsha, uh, we were we had a certainty that. Uh, that there can be a better world which is more just and more equal and it is going to happen in our lifetimes and we are going to be part of that change. I think young people today have lost that conviction and people of my generation are largely responsible for the disillusionment uh, that they face. And I think that we need, you know, hope is absolutely critical. Uh, I have a, a young Muslim uh, uh, activist in the citizenship uh, protest was in prison and locked up like others and when he uh, came out, one of the few who came out, he, he took care to actually write on, on, his, on his mask and face the that No Citizenship Amendment Act. I mean, he, he came out of jail and he said it. I spoke to him and, and I spoke to him, he, had, he suffered a lot but he when I asked him about hope and he said, you know, uh, he said uh, in Urdu, he said, Mayusi uh, kufra uh, which literally means uh, to despair is blasphemy. So, you know, you can call it blasphemy, you can call it treason. Uh, so, but where is the source of our hope? Our source of our hope has to be located in a new imagination. What kind of economy do we want to create, which is uh, you know, which is an alter alternative to neoliberalism. What kind of economy which will ensure health care for all after what we've seen in the pandemic, which provides social security to all. Uh, you know, the three crises that I think uh, young people will have to resolve for their futures is how do we deal with inequality, how do we deal with difference, and how do we deal with climate. And I think that we, we don't have an imagination, uh, a comprehensive imagination for each of these. 
And my sense is that this comprehensive imagination has to be located centrally in the idea of solidarity. Uh, you know, uh, that we belong to and with each other. Uh, and it is in, in, in that spirit, uh, you know, that what is happening, uh, you know, to communities in Kurdistan uh, equally, uh, you know, uh, should cause anguish and pain to me uh, and likewise. Uh, and, and I think if we create a new imagination based on that central principle of solidarity, of fraternity, uh, of uh, uh, mutual care. Uh, uh, Noam Chomsky was asked, what does the idea of social um, protection mean? He said, it is the idea that we must take care of each other. You know, a principle, starting with a principle like that, what is our imagination of the economy? What is our imagination of, uh, of, of living with diversity? What is our imagination of, uh, of, of, of planning for the climate, uh, for climate change? And I think that uh, there are many things we need to do together, but I, one of the things that I think is really crucial is this new imagination. Thank you so much, Harsh. That is indeed the question. How do we take care of each other? I might add, given the current situation, how do we take care of each other against our enemies and confront broadly the ca crises of capital, climate, and empire. Thank you so much, Tuba, Dilar, and Harsh for joining us for today's panel. To all of you watching, thank you for sticking with us. We have some terrific speakers coming up right after this, including Rafael Correa, the former president of Ecuador, Salai Kafar from the Solidarity Party of Afghanistan, and many, many more. Tomorrow, you'll see some terrific keynotes from Rana Ayub, journalist from India, a conversation between Dilma Rousseff and Jeremy Corbyn, as well as a panel called Can Imperialism Be Defeated? So do stick around for day one and day two of Summit at the End of the World. And once again, remember that everything that we do here at the Progressive International is possible only because of small donations from people like you. So really, if you can, please do consider becoming a monthly donor. Five, ten dollars from each of you goes a long way in making this movement possible. Thank you so much for joining and we'll see you again. Compañeras, compañeros del Internacional Progresista, un inmenso abrazo en este segundo aniversario de nuestra organización. ¿Qué quisiera que el mundo escuche en esta cumbre? Que para nosotros los progresistas, la política es una misión. La misión de dejar este mundo mucho mejor de aquel que encontramos. De acabar con los dos grandes pecados capitales del mundo actual. La terrible, insultante, obscena inequidad, tanto al interior de países como entre países, y la destrucción del único planeta que tenemos. Y para el caso de los políticos latinoamericanos, esa misión debe ser una obsesión, debe ser una pasión. Sacar definitivamente a nuestra región del subdesarrollo, 200 años, son suficientes. Y eso no lo vamos a lograr con la intelequia del mercado. Necesitamos sociedades con mercado, donde el mercado esté en función de las necesidades sociales y no la sociedad esté en función de las necesidades mercantiles. No debemos aceptar sociedades de mercado donde la vida, las personas, la misma sociedad se convierten en una mercancía más. No vamos a alcanzar el desarrollo con la suma de acciones individuales, sino con la acción colectiva consciente. No lo vamos a alcanzar con la absurda competencia, sino con la cooperación. Ese debe ser parte, humildemente, de nuestro mensaje hacia el mundo. La política como misión. Y para eso hay que superar poderosos enemigos. Una prensa, instrumento del status quo, que en lugar de ser guardiana de la verdad, es la primera en habernos la robado. Un mundo bajo el imperio del capital, todo está en función del capital y con una doble moral terrible. Nuestro principal instrumento para esa lucha debe ser la verdad. Y eso es lo que vamos a defender, promover, proponer en esta cumbre progresista. Un inmenso abrazo y hasta la victoria siempre. Dear comrades, uh, congratulations on second anniversary of Progressive International. As a council member, I congratulate the Secretariat for all their hard work and commitment toward our shared goal and visions. Well, the world today is deeply embroiled in crisis and conflict. 
The ongoing crisis in Ukraine signifies the growing antagonisms among world powers and lays bare the truth about the predatory capitalist system, which is careering along a course that is struggled for its survival by waging bloody wars in the world. We all know that the US, which feels rel relatively safe from the Ukraine war, adds fuel to the fire and makes billions of dollars in profits from arms sales. The situation will provide more favorable objective conditions for the anti-capitalist and progressive movement to get united to a common platform taking practical steps toward fighting the imperialism. Dear friends and comrades, while the war in Ukraine has made headlines, please don't forget that Afghanistan has been the wrestling arena of the Western and regional reactionary powers for almost five decades. Today, Islamic fundamentalists, the most sordid vampire henchmen of imperialism, have reduced it to a pile of rubble and a land of lamentation. The return of the Taliban as the latest imperialist pawn and the regional chessboard, our elevated nation finds itself at the mercy of the incredibly ignorant and anachronistic evil entity which is bent on smashing all human values with the casual of Islamic Sharia law and turning the Afghan homeland into a veritable inferno. Well, dear friends, Notwithstanding, here in Afghanistan, emancipation resistance is alive and kicking. I call upon the Progressive International and the associated organizations and all intellectuals and individuals to support the progressive movements in Afghanistan in their fight against the Islamic fundamentalism, notably the Taliban, which is an integral part of the global struggle against the capitalism and imperialism. Imperialism and Islamic fundamentalisms are basically two sides of one coin. Islamic fundamentalists either overtly or covertly have always served American and other Western powers' political and economic interests. It's an obvious fact right now for everyone. Well, the Belmarsh Tribunal was indeed a remarkable attempt by the Progressive International to hold the U.S. accountable for the war crimes they committed in Afghanistan and Iraq. Well, we need to build upon it and move forward by helping the progressive elements in Afghanistan to document atrocities committed by the U.S. and NATO forces, which would eventually lead to bringing war criminals to justice. Here, the Afghan youth, particularly the girls who have been denied an education by the Taliban, must be empowered, and as they could be the backbone of a progressive movement in Afghanistan in future. Let us renew our pledge to remain faithful to our path and our lofty aims, and not to falter for an instant in fighting imperialism. In such a quest, we have nothing but our blood to lose and a world to win. Eternal glory to the progressive movements all over the world. The truth is with us. We shall prevail. Thank you. Olá, pessoal, tudo bem? Eu sou Antônio Lisboa, secretário de Relações Internacionais da CUT Brasil. Estou passando aqui para manifestar nosso orgulho, nossa satisfação, nossa honra de participar da Internacional Progressista e poder comemorar juntos estes dois primeiros anos da Internacional Progressista. Eu não tenho dúvida de que, nesse mundo tão complicado que a gente vive, a criação dessa rede, com a participação de tantos atores, sindicalistas, acadêmicos, ONGs, partidos políticos, organizações sociais, é fundamental para que se possamos fazer um esforço e buscar caminhos, formular políticas, formular ideias para a saída da crise em que o mundo passa nesse momento. Portanto, é vida longa para todos nós, vida longa para as nossas organizações, vida longa para a Internacional Progressista. Aqui no Brasil nós estamos 
já desde 2016, quando sofremos um golpe parlamentar midiático, estamos enfrentando uma situação gravíssima e hoje com o um governo fascista liderado por Jair Bolsonaro. Estamos enfrentando um governo que ataca os direitos fundamentais, ataca as juventudes, ataca as mulheres, desrespeita os direitos trabalhistas, direitos laborais, massacra os povos originais e leva o nosso país a uma situação de catástrofe social e ambiental. Ao mesmo tempo, nós estamos, este ano de 2022, com eleições presidenciais e a nossa luta, a nossa batalha aqui é a eleição do ex-presidente Lula. Nós temos certeza que só com a eleição do ex-presidente Lula será possível resgatar o nosso país para o nosso povo. Queremos, com isso, é, contar com o apoio de todas as organizações sociais, dos acadêmicos, é, dos sindicatos, enfim, de todas as pessoas é, que têm preocupação com as mudanças no país que possam nos ajudar nessa imensa batalha que, será, que serão as eleições de outubro deste ano. Nós estamos, como disse, lutando muito para trazer de volta o nosso país para o nosso povo e para isso precisamos eleger o Lula. E temos certeza que podemos contar com o apoio de vocês. Então, um grande abraço. Continuamos juntos aqui na Internacional Progressista. I'm very happy to see that the Progressive International connected so many people and movements around the globe in the last two years. But we should remember that they are not only people on this planet, but that we are completely dependent on other living species and that without that web of life, our survival might be threatened. The biodiversity of species is crashing. Habitats are being destroyed. Air, soil and water are being polluted. And though we know that the reasons for that are in the capitalist extractivist economies, a lot of false solutions are being proposed in a way similar that we don't just ask for climate action, but for climate justice, we must do the same for nature conservation. And this is particularly important this year because the international policy proposals for the next decade are going to be discussed. One policy is called 30 by 30 and would mean protecting 30% of the Earth's surface for nature conservation by 2030. This in some countries will certainly mean a huge land grab. For example, in Tanzania, 150,000 Maasai are at risk of losing their traditional homelands because they are forcefully being removed for an extended protected area. This means they lose access to their grazing lands, no possibility to collect firewood or plants, completely losing access to the lands they have lived in for thousands of years. What is needed is not only nice words in the policy proposals, but real change on the ground. What we need are land rights for indigenous people and local communities who have proved to be the best stewards of biodiversity and very successful in protecting their lands from industrial activities. We have to look at all these proposals from a justice angle. So on one hand, we have to fight the extractive industries and at the same time, we have to push for justice within the conservation movement. Not only for the land rights, but also for restoration projects, which are not funded by carbon credits. We have to connect the conservation movement to other movements for justice and create more connections, not only between movements, but also between us and other living species. Eu quero saudar a todas as companheiras e companheiros da Internacional Progressista e agradecer o convite para que eu me torne um novo membro dessa importante organização. A Internacional Progressista representa uma articulação de lutas e de sonhos, de projeto de futuro, de gente que está atuando nos quatro cantos do planeta, com um espaço importante das periferias, com um espaço importante do sul global. Mais do que nunca, a gente precisa fortalecer os nossos laços, as nossas redes de solidariedade 
para enfrentar a extrema direita. Ela sim, hoje, está muito bem organizada em escala internacional, compartilhando técnicas, métodos de atuação em redes sociais, narrativas, estratégias que são as mesmas na Europa, na América Latina, na América do Norte. Nós precisamos fortalecer e aprofundar as nossas articulações. No Brasil, nesse ano de 2022, nós temos uma verdadeira encruzilhada histórica. Não é apenas mais uma eleição, é a oportunidade do nosso povo recuperar a soberania e virar a página mais triste e dramática da nossa história recente. Bolsonaro representa a devastação da Amazônia, o genocídio de mais de 650 mil brasileiros pelo negacionismo na pandemia. Representa o país que é o terceiro maior produtor de alimentos no mundo ter voltado ao mapa da fome com 19 milhões de pessoas com insegurança alimentar grave. Bolsonaro representa a morte dos sonhos e do futuro. Eleger o Lula esse ano não é apenas trocar um governo. Eleger o Lula é permitir que o Brasil volte a respirar, permitir que o nosso povo possa de novo ter esperança. E a gente vai precisar muito que os olhos do mundo todo estejam voltados para o nosso país. Porque a democracia está em xeque, porque o Bolsonaro representa um projeto selvagem de autoritarismo, de eliminação, um projeto profundamente antipopular. Vamos precisar muito contar com todas e todos vocês para enfrentar o desafio desse ano no Brasil e contem com a gente na articulação de lutas e solidariedade internacional. Viva a Internacional Progressista! चर्चा हो रही है ये बहुत जरूरी है कि इंडिया में जो हो रहा है उसके बारे में बात करना हमारे देश में एक ऐसा कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन है जिसको हम कहते हैं कि हमारे ये बहुत दुनिया में सबसे ज्यादा बेहतर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन है जिसमें हर एक समुदाय को मार्जिनलाइज कम्युनिटी हो या जो 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 अलग-अलग तरीके के विचारधारा में रखते हो सोशो इकोनॉमिकल लेवल पर हो सब के सबको एक इक्वल सिटीजनशिप राइट्स के बारे में और फंडामेंटल राइट्स देता है और प्रोटेक्ट करता है हमारे जो प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ डायरेक्टर्स है वो इतने इतनी बेहतरीन है इस देश का कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन पर इस देश के कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन से हम देखते हैं कि हर साल हर 5 सालों में सरकारें आती हैं और वो सरकार देश को चलाती है और वो सरकार जब आती है तो वो सबकी होती है वो किसी एक समुदाय की एक आइडेंटिटी की एक धर्म की नहीं होती है लेकिन 2014 के बाद से हम देख रहे हैं कि ये पूरा रंग जो है वो पूरा एक सेफ्रोनाइज में बदल गया है 2014 के बाद बीजेपी सरकार के आने से हमारी पूरा जो जितने भी हमारी ऑटोनोमस इंस्टीट्यूशंस हैं हमारी जो ऑटोनोमस स्पेसेस है जो 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 हमारा जुडिशियल सिस्टम है हमारा हमारा मीडिया है उसको पूरी तरह से ये सरकार ने अपने अंडर में ले लिया है और अपनी विचारधारा से अपने से अपने भगवाकरण भगवाकरण के माहौल में ये पूरी तरह से ये सारा इंस्टीट्यूशन सब काम कर रहा है तो जो जो यहां पे इस समाज में जो प्रोग्रेसिव है जो फेमिनिस्ट है जो एक्टिविस्ट है जो स्टूडेंट्स है जो उनकी वॉइसेस है उनके सवाल है उनका जो उनके जो क्रिटिक्स है उसके लिए जगह ही नहीं रही इस देश में बात करने के लिए और जो लोग ये बात करते हैं उनको ये यूएपीओ सेडिशन के अंदर डाला जाता है तो ये ये हमारे लिए बहुत बड़ा डेंजरस माहौल है क्योंकि इस देश का जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन है जहां पर ह्यूमन राइट्स वायलेशन को बिल्कुल भी जगह नहीं है यहां हर दिन वायलेशंस हो रहे हैं हर दिन ये हर दिन अलग-अलग सेक्शंस के लोगों को खास करके दलितों को मुसलमानों को मुसलमान औरतों को जो जो कमजोर वर्ग है जो गरीब वर्ग है ट्राइबल्स हैं जो नोमेडिक्स हैं उनके ऊपर हर दिन टारगेट होता जा रहा है और पिछले कुछ समय से तो हम यही देख रहे हैं कि किसी ना किसी बहाने से मुसलमानों पर हमला करो किसी ना किसी बहाने से पहले बीफ के ऊपर हमला किया फिर जय श्री राम बोलकर हमला किया फिर उनके ऊपर फिर घर वापसी लव जिहाद और पॉपुलेशन कंट्रोल बिल हर तरीके के हर तरीके से कानून के जरिए पॉलिसी के जरिए अपने मॉब अपने अपना क्राउड के जरिए सड़कों पर जिस तरह से मोरल जिस तरह से मोरल पुलिसिंग का क्राउड के जरिए हर दिन जो है वो मुसलमानों पर हमला हो रहा है हर दिन जो है जो लोग बात करते हैं अपनी बातें रखते हैं उनके ऊपर हमला हो रहा है अब ये जो रिसेंटली जो सुली बुली एप्स के जरिए पूरा जो जो पूरा कैंपेन किया गया मुसलमान औरतों के खिलाफ उनकी बॉडी पर बॉडी को डिस्क्राइब किया गया ये तो सेक्सुअल असॉल्ट है 
कि किस कैसे सौ से ज़्यादा मुसलमान औरतों को को सोशल मीडिया में उसके खिलाफ उसकी उनके शक्कर उनके पिक्चर्स डाले गए और, और लोगों को ये बोला जा रहा है कि जाओ इनको खरीदो ये तुम ये इनकी नीलामी की जा रही है और ये सरकार कुछ नहीं कह रही यही सरकार जो कह रही है कि अब की बार अब की बार जो है वो हमारी सरकार हम महिलाओं को सुरक्षा देंगे बेटियों को सुरक्षा देंगे विकास देंगे कहाँ है विकास कहाँ है बेटियों की सुरक्षा हर दिन मुसलमान औरतों के खिलाफ बोला जा रहा है धर्म संसद के जरिए कहा जा रहा है कि सश वेपन उठाओ पुस्तक नहीं बुक्स नहीं वेपन उठाओ ये खुले आम खुले आम एक, एक, एक मुस्लिम समुदाय के खिलाफ ऐसे भाषण दिए जा रहे हैं हेट स्पीच दिए जा रहे हैं और सरकार कुछ नहीं कर रही है हमारे प्राइम मिनिस्टर कुछ नहीं कर रहे हैं तो ये डेमोक्रेसी किसकी है फिर ये कौन सा कौन सा लोकतंत्र है जहाँ पे ये सरकार लोकतंत्र के नाम से ये पार्टी ये इलेक्शन देती है जीतती है और उसके बाद में ये जीतती है तो वो किसके लिए किसके खिलाफ जीतती है हर दिन मुसलमानों के के नाम से जो नफ़रतें जो हेट स्पीच जो बातें की जा रही है वो बहुत ही ख़तरनाक है और इसलिए हमें ज़रूरी है इस तरह के कॉन्फ्रेंसेस के ज़रिए हमें इकट्ठा आने की ज़रूरत है कि ये जो इंटरनेशनल ह्यूमन राइट्स ग्रुप्स हैं जो प्रोग्रेसिव है फेमिनिस्ट है, है जितने भी हमारे कलेक्टिव है हमें एक साथ आना होगा और हमें इस फाशिज़म को डिफीट करना होगा शुक्रिया Olá amigos e amigas da Internacional Progressista, eu sou Juliano Medeiros, presidente do Partido Socialismo e Liberdade do Brasil e quero trazer o abraço do nosso partido a todos os amigos e amigas que participam dessa cúpula do fim do mundo. E quero compartilhar com vocês as lutas que o pessoal tem travado no Brasil. O Brasil que se tornou nos últimos anos o laboratório de uma experiência macabra. Talvez uma das mais macabras experiências que as elites brasileiras já desenvolveram contra o nosso povo. Nós temos hoje um governo de extrema direita. Um governo violento que tem como propósito destruir as conquistas sociais do povo brasileiro, regredir em relação às garantias democráticas que foram firmadas na Constituição de 1988, desmontar a legislação de proteção ambiental e tornar mais vulneráveis ainda os povos indígenas tradicionais e de origem quilombola. Essa experiência nos ensinou que é necessário em momentos graves como esse buscar a construção da unidade das esquerdas. A esquerda no Brasil, como em diferentes partes do mundo, é muito diversa. Aqui convivem tradições desde a social-democracia, passando pelo trabalhismo, alcançando o comunismo, o socialismo libertário. São muitas tradições políticas na esquerda brasileira que também fazem parte da nossa riqueza e da nossa diversidade. Nós do PSOL, que somos um partido jovem, um partido que representa hoje o casamento, a aliança das lutas em defesa da democracia, dos direitos sociais, da soberania nacional, com as lutas em defesa do feminismo, do meio ambiente e dos direitos humanos, ou como nós costumamos chamar, o casamento do socialismo e da liberdade, temos cumprido a nossa parte, o nosso papel na construção dessa unidade. As eleições que acontecem em outubro aqui no Brasil vão ser fundamentais para definir o rumo da democracia no, no nosso continente, na América Latina, na América do Sul em particular. Por isso eu peço aos amigos e amigas da Internacional Progressista que estejam atentos ao processo eleitoral no Brasil, que nos ajudem a denunciar os crimes e as violências sofridas pelos lutadores e lutadoras sociais do Brasil e que junto conosco defendam também a nossa frágil, mas indispensável democracia. Um forte abraço a todos os amigos e amigas da Internacional Progressista. My name is Yambio David Oliver and I come from South Sudan. I was forced to flee my country 
Since 2016, I was deprived from my family. I was separated from my loved ones. And with so much struggle, I found myself in Libya. When I arrived in Libya, what I was met with was not what I expected. Upon my arrival, I expected to be embraced. I expected to be welcomed as a war victim. But in the return, I was met with nightmares made of torture, made of uh, forced rebel, made of uh, arbitrary detentions and ransoms, including kidnapping. In Libya, I was forced to work for free as a slave. I have been forced to pay ransom. I was and I have been detained arbitrarily without any judicial review. And when these atrocities before me, I tried to escape Libya through the Mediterranean Sea to reach the European shore. But in return, I was faced with the European member states pushing me back. I was forcibly intercepted by the so-called Libyan Coast Guard and brought back to the Newman Detention Centers, where I was detained for a period of seven months, followed by hard labor, like a slave, without any judicial review. In Libya, I am nobody. People like me are facing a lot of racial discrimination, religious, and other cultural discrimination within the country. The UNHCR turned away from us. They shut the door in our face and we had no one to turn to. As I'm talking, refugees, my brothers, sisters, people who are with me, friends, are still detained in the detention centers of Anzara. And we are not talking about 10 individuals. We are talking about more than 600 minors, families, or disabled, elderly people who are arbitrarily detained. Their human rights are fully violated because we are nobody, we have no voice. Since Europe is funding this, since Europe is paying the militias to keep us away from their borders, we have been praying, we have been crying. In this detention center, and in Libya at large, our women are raped, we are killed, and the perpetrators are not brought before justice. On this day today, I take this opportunity to call on all of you to stand in solidarity with the migrants population in Libya, with the refugees in Libya, with people on the move, the affected individuals, because we are traumatized with all the racial discrimination, hindrance from my fundamental human rights. I have developed post-traumatic disorder. I have gone through hard times trying to find myself, traumas and mental health problem. A lot of people are facing this. We are calling for a voice for visibility for the people in Libya, for the migrants, refugees, people who are f fleeing countries of terror, countries of civil war, like my war torn country, South Sudan. Today, be our voice. I'm sharing this testimony because I want to be part of the change. I am dreaming of a new world. Do not let me dream alone. We can dream together. We can make the world a better place for everyone, regardless of our color, of our religion, educational background. And this border pushback should end. At the same time, I seize this opportunity to call on the EU 
policymakers on migration to revise its policy and make sure that we are protected. People trying to reach its borders are not turned away by violent behaviors, are not turned away under gunpoint. Thank you. Hola, quiero enviar un abrazo muy grande a toda la Internacional Progresista y a las compañeras y compañeros que estamos participando y haciendo esta cumbre del fin del mundo. Pensamos el nombre del fin del mundo porque se iba a llevar adelante en, en Ushuaia, en la ciudad de Ushuaia, la ciudad más austral del mundo, pero también es un, un nombre sugerente para, para un evento de estas características. Sabemos que Frederick Jameson decía que es más fácil imaginar el fin del mundo que el fin del capitalismo. Y el fin del mundo, eh, como dice esta convocatoria, ya está ocurriendo, pero de a pedacitos, ¿no? de esa forma apocalíptica de las películas eh, de, de Hollywood, sino que ocurre con el sometimiento y la exclusión de millones y millones de seres humanos, eh, con el saqueo de nuestros territorios y en la destrucción cotidiana de las más diversas formas de la vida. En esta conferencia estamos quienes queremos detener esa degradación, quienes queremos activar el freno de emergencia frente a una carrera desenfrenada del capitalismo. Pero lo más importante de todo, estamos quienes soñamos, quienes queremos volver a imaginar el fin del capitalismo neoliberal. Para esa tarea, las luchas de las mujeres y lesbianas, gays, bisexuales, travestis, trans y y el horizonte que nos plantea el feminismo popular es de una importancia realmente vital. Las mujeres estuvimos y estamos al frente de las principales resistencias contra el neoliberalismo de este siglo XXI, en los movimientos urbanos por la vivienda, en las luchas de los movimientos sociales por trabajo y dignidad, en la resistencia indígena y campesina contra el agronegocio, en las nuevas organizaciones de las clases trabajadoras, en la conquista de los nuevos derechos y autonomía sobre nuestros cuerpos y nuestros territorios. Fuimos, sin lugar a duda, quienes estuvimos a la cabeza de la pelea contra el COVID, eh, trabajando en la salud, en el cuidado y en los servicios, y también en la construcción de nuevos proyectos populares, de nuevas esperanzas para nuestras sociedades, y vimos surgir liderazgos extraordinarios de compañeras. El feminismo popular tiene un gran potencial emancipatorio porque realiza un cuestionamiento integral al sistema de jerarquías y de opresiones que está entrelazado estructuralmente con la reproducción del capital. En un contexto de avanzada neoliberal de orden global, tiene la virtud de poder denunciar y dejar al descubierto que las desigualdades existentes son un producto del sistema. No son errores o cosas por mejorar, sino una parte constitutiva de la reproducción de este orden injusto eh, y opresivo. En definitiva, si la política tiene que ser el arte de hacer posible lo que hasta ayer resultaba imposible, la política feminista es fundamental para imaginar y para ser creíble para millones que podemos vivir en un mundo en el que seamos socialmente iguales, humanamente diferentes y totalmente libres. Un abrazo grande. We bring solidarity greetings from the Coalition for Revolution Core, Nigeria. My name is Baba Aye. I'm a co-convener of Core, which brings together socialist groups, pan-Africanist groups, the Federation of Informal Workers Organization, and the African Action Congress, a revolutionary party in our country. It is awesome to think that It's just two years since the Progressive International was formed. We are happy to congratulate PI on the leaps and bounds of its involvement in struggles of peoples across continents in this period. And it reflects the times we are in and which to us is one of the reasons why the team of this summit is very apt. We are at the end of the world. We are with struggle. We bring back to a new world. We in Nigeria, as core, we are the four 
of such struggles of the people. The answers rebellion against police brutality, we were there standing firmly as part of the people. We stand with workers on strikes. There have been waves of strikes. Just as across the world, we are having severe contestation between the old that refuses to die and the new that struggles to be given birth to through the efforts of working class people and youths at the barricade. Come 2023, the African Action Congress will for the second time go to the polls as the voice for revolutionary change. The Coalition for Revolution will be at the barricades promoting, supporting, deepening the organized self-activity of the working class people and the youths in Nigeria. And we stand with the struggles of the people across the world for a better world. We support your struggles and urge solidarity for our struggles. Once again, we salute PI. Viva Progressive International. Greetings to the summit. Uh, we are Sikra Movement. I'm Orshia Shudar, uh, part of the presidential board. Uh, my name is uh, David Chepregi. I'm also part of the presidential board of Sikra. Sikra was founded in 2019 in uh, Budapest, Hungary, during the municipal elections. We have felt that there is a vacu vacuum in left-wing politics in Hungary, which needs to be filled in, but not with another left-wing party, but with a movement. We are trying to use electoral politics to form an allegiance between left-wing parties and uh, these civic uh, single-issue movements. There's a lot of organizational work ahead of us because the Hungarian working class and the progressive part of the middle class are still really divided. After the 2019 municipal elections where all of the candidates who we supported won, we decided to be even more formalized and to create an association that is able to navigate legally as well as organizationally and to form a platform for people who want to join us. And we became an association in 2020 and we have gone through a lot of um, internal changes since then. So we work in committees and we have a presidential board with a central committee as well and uh, we have built re regional connections in the past two years we have got into contact with Lavica Slovenia we have uh, contact with Mojemo as well as Rajam in uh, Poland and uh, this is an important part of um, how we want to proceed uh, after these elections the most recent elections that we do want to create a political balance on the left that is not just locally relevant, so not only in Budapest, not only in Hungary, but can build connections in the region as well. We have 120 active members at this point. We have around 100 passive members who do activist work, but uh, do not take part of uh, executive decision making or, um, or other everyday tasks in the, in the organization. And we have supporters and activists who are less connected to uh, the maintenance of the organization. But one important part of SICRE is, is that when you join, you can actually join in the work of creating the, or maintaining the organization. You can change things. So we do have this uh, saying amongst ourselves that whoever joins at this point is kind of a founder of the organization. Our most recent and actually biggest project was the electoral campaign for Andras Jambor. The campaign uh, took place in Budapest in the 6th electoral district. Jambor was successful during the opposition of primaries as well as the official election as well. So this point Sikra has a member of parliament. Uh, we are planning to use the mandate of Jambor to vocalize uh, these issues around 
the housing crisis, workers' rights, etc. Uh, but we don't all, don't want to be active only on the grounds of party politics. We have plans to collaborate with unions on organizing workers on the work sites. We are planning to use the organizational uh, methods in various places uh, of, uh, of actually everyday life in Hungary. So we are trying to maintain our status as a multi-tendency organization and use the, or use the uh, working class organizational methods as well as electoral politics and parliamentary politics because we believe that these two things are not uh, contradicting themselves but actually can be uh, complementary. We discussed many times why uh, the elections went down the way they did uh, in this year and uh, one of our uh, lessons was that we won in this district because we did a lot of uh, direct voter contact uh, in the district because we knocked on uh, most of the doors. We, we really talked to the people. So the, the next plan for Sikra is to, to plan for 20 years, for 15 years ahead. And the changing the current political atmosphere can only be done with collaboration and on the long run. And nothing can be achieved in short uh, strategic planning. And we believe that this could happen regionally with most effect. And lastly, thank you for the summit, for the opportunity to introduce ourselves and our movement. We hope that we can meet you in person really soon. Estimados compañeros y compañeras, mi nombre es Luis Arce y soy el secretario general del Partido Frente Amplio de Costa Rica. El Frente Amplio eh, se alegra con la incorporación a la Internacional Progresista, sabiendo que nuestro partido y nuestro movimiento representará, desde luego, los intereses más genuinos de justicia social, paz y lucha por los derechos para todas las personas. Nuestra nueva fracción legislativa, integrada por seis compañeros y compañeras, representa ese cambio generacional en Costa Rica y en la región. Consideramos esencial el fortalecer los lazos con los distintos movimientos, organizaciones. Las luchas que podremos dar de cara al nuevo siglo solamente podremos hacerlo de manera articulada entre todos y todas. En estos nuevos tiempos que se nos exige una batalla en todos los sentidos, desde la disputa de los sentidos comunes eh, hasta aquellas en las que nos hemos mantenido siempre, como es en las calles, con las comunidades, Consideramos también fundamental el poder ejercer junto con la gente nuevas alternativas de cambio. También no podemos dejar pasar que en este nuevo siglo son las compañeras, las mujeres, las que con impulso han convocado una agenda que nos invita a toda la sociedad y particularmente a los hombres a generar cambios tangibles a favor de los derechos de las mujeres. En el Frente Amplio están las puertas abiertas para la esperanza. Y en Costa Rica seremos nosotros esta fuerza la que aspira y la que mantiene el compromiso para que todas las personas tengan los derechos y con justicia social. Muchas gracias. That's it for today, friends. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to all of our speakers for giving us their time and energy. A huge shout out to my comrades at the Secretariat, especially the video, design and translations team who've been working overtime to make this broadcast possible. We'll see you tomorrow with an incredible lineup once again.